next part, which is when we start really speaking about statistics. So we are going to speak about distribution in uh, in uh, in uh, in Python. Uh, sorry, in statistics, how we can play with them in Python, and then slide into statistical hypothesis testing. I know that probability distribution is not necessarily the sexiest topic, but if you understand a bit better what a statistical distribution is, what they are, and how we manipulate them, then statistical hypothesis testing makes a lot more sense. So it's very important that we, you know, pave the way toward that. Okay. So um, probability distribution. So I always start by Okay, a little bit of import. Okay, I make sure that I have matplotlib, seaborn, uh, scipyloss stats will be our main library to doing statistics for now, pandas and numpy. All right, so we can ask the question, what is a probability uh, distribution? So up, oh, I'm going to plot here. It's much easier with a visual representation. So a probability distribution is a, if you wish, it's a, tool that we use to describe the behavior of a random variable. So that is a quantity uh, or a variable whose quantity will vary. And it varies, if you will, it varies randomly, but this randomness is, has a rule to it that some events have more probability of occurring than others. And the pattern of the probability of occurring of these events is what makes the distribution. So we like to represent a, a distribution by using its probability density function when it's continuous or probability mass function when it's discrete. Uh, okay, that's just a question of terms, but the idea is that you want to have different event and each event is weighted by its probability of occurring, all right? And you can either represent it like this with a density, uh, probability density function, or in a cumulative way where you just accumulate the probability. And because we talk about uh, probabilities here, the basically the sum of all the elements of the, probab the total probability of all events always sums to one, okay? Kind of makes sense. You have the distribution representing the entirety of what can happen. And so then the total probability of everything is one by definition. And that's why here in this cumulative plot, we start at zero and we arrive at one, okay? And then again, we start at zero and we arrive at one. That's a generic property of probability uh, the uh, probability uh, distribution, which uh, we use a lot to simplify our computations later on. All right. So here I show to you, I think, two distribution which you might have heard about. Uh, first one, I'm sure you've heard about it, is the normal distribution. Okay, you can see this little bell shape, very symmetrical here. This is uh, centered on zero and with a standard deviation of one. So that's the that's the um, central and scaled uh, normal distribution. And here you have an alternative, which is a binomial low. So this one is also fairly common. A binomial low is uh, it's it's a low that describes how many success you have among n trial with each trial having a probability P of success. And here that corresponds to five trial and each trial having a 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.4 probability of success, okay? And so you can see that you have a certain probability of having two, three, four, and so on and so forth. All right, so far so good. Simple enough. Okay. So as you can see, when I've talked to you about these different distribution, either the normal or the binomial, I've named them, but I also used numbers to qualify exactly what they were. This is a normal distribution with mean zero standard deviation one. Or this is a binomial distribution with 
n, so a number of trial five, and probably TP 0 0.4, okay? So that means that on top of just saying what they are, we have to also specify a bit where and what they look like. So for the standard deviation, for many, um, sorry, for the normal distribution and for many, many uh, distribution, this boils down to their mean, which we call also their location, because the mean is basically where you are, and their standard deviation, or also called scale, because that describes the spread of the points. Uh, and we use these two things to specify exactly what no, what distribution we have in front of us. So here's different uh, example, three examples, one with location zero scale one, location minus two scale one, location one scale three, and there you can see them. So you see that changing the mean changes the location, changing the scale or standard deviation changes the spread around our mean, okay? Again, I think this is simple enough, just maybe if that was, if you have, if you have not done any start in a long time, then I think that this kind of uh, puts something back in front of your mind. And in terms of just the notation, uh, what we say is that we have a random variable for some X, and we say that it follows something uh, specific by using this tilde character there. So X follows a normal distribution of mean M and standard deviation S. Okay, that's just the notation that we use. Now, I want to spend some time to explain to you or to, uh, yeah, to come back to why everyone talks so much about the normal distribution. And the normal distribution is maybe the most well-known distribution and with a good reason. Um, for instance, if you have computed any 95% confidence interval, you may have heard about like this value of 1.96, or you might also have heard about two standard deviation. Are you at X standard deviation away from the mean? And if you are above two, then that means that you are significant. Has any of you heard about uh, about this sort of rule of them? Yes, no? Yes, some of you, maybe not many. Yes? No for some? Okay. So this is a very, very, very classical uh, thing. And that is, if you will, that's due to a fairly peculiar, but super useful <laughs> property of random variables. So I will uh, sit, cite Wikipedia there. In some situation, when some independent random variables are added together. So imagine you have a bunch of random variables. They are completely independent. When you sum them together, they tend toward a normal distribution. And you take any sort of, uh, of random variable, when you have enough of them summed together, poof, you get uh, a normal distribution. So that's kind of a nice, um, a nice and, you know, uh, property, but, when it becomes super powerful is when you consider that a, a mean, an average, is a, at its core, it's a sum. So you sum everything in your data, and it's just that at the end, you will divide it by the number of observations, but it's a sum. And each element in this sum are different observations of a random variable. And if they were then drawn independently, you have your independent random variable. So that means that when you have enough sample in your data and they were drawn independently, then the mean of your of you know of your sample will follow a normal distribution. And that's a fairly strong property because if you know that it follows a normal distribution, then you can predict and you can make a lot of prediction on that. And if you can make prediction, that means that you can test hypotheses. Okay, makes sense so far? Yes, of course, I would say that you don't want to take me at face value. And for me, I like never to take things at face value because here it says 
I need to have enough sample, right? So what is enough? And we'll see that in a second. First, let's just check this first property. So I will here use a lot of simulation during the rest of the course, because each time I make some sort of grand assertion like that, I like to use some simulation to demonstrate it to you. And that can be also useful to test the limit. Okay, how much sample is enough? Uh, is five enough or do I need at least 100 and so on and so forth? So here, imagine that we have sample. We, uh, we have, you know, uh, sorry, 100 samples. And we draw them not from a normal distribution, but from a, what we call an exponential distribution. So it does kind of a decrease, an exponential decay decrease curve like this. We draw these samples each time made with 100 uh, sample and we compute their mean. So with this here little function. So I draw one sample there and then I will, let's say for instance, do it 10 times. So I will have 10 means of samples of size 100 each, then 100, then uh, 100 that. And then I will plot them and we'll see a bit what this looks like. So one sample look like this. So this is the PDF of the exponential. And you can see they are a bit tiny, but you can see here the individual sample point uh, as here tiny uh, orange little uh, little dots here. If I only have 10 points, this is what this 10 means. So these are not individual points, but these are the mean of sample of size 100. They look like this. And as I get more and more and more, you can see that indeed, they have this sort of bell shape here, which actually correspond to something close to a normal. Okay. That works. Now you could say, okay, this is with simulation. So we can actually do the same thing with um, with actual data. So here I will play again with my census uh, fraction data, which we created in the previous notebook. So what I do is that I won't use the entire uh, the entire data frame because that means that if I have the entire data frame, I have the whole population. Instead, what I will do is I will draw a small sample. So imagine that, for instance, you didn't have the full census data. So you would do a bunch of polls. You would randomly choose 10 cities and gather information and then do this again with 10 cities, again with 10 cities and so on and so forth. And this is basically what happens. If you, if you do it, if you do one poll, we have here the privilege of knowing the population mean. Uh, and, uh, and we have here our, our little poll. And we can compute then the difference between each of our poll and the population mean. So you can see that if I repeat that, sometime I will be slightly under the population mean, sometime much more under, sometimes a lot under, sometimes above, and so on and so forth. So you can see that, you know, this average there of my sample is kind of randomly hovering around the population mean. There was a question by Ahmad. I was, I was about to ask uh, that the numbers are different to you, but now as you said, it's random. So now I understand. Exactly, yes. So that's here. Yeah, indeed, we can see a little bit of the randomness. At each time we draw 10 other cities and so on and so forth. And we can kind of look at what happened if we did a lot of, if we did a lot of these polls, we would see who, like what is the pattern of this difference between the population mean and the sample mean, okay? So I repeat now the same thing 1000 times and each time I keep the mean of the poll and then I plot that. And so this is what we see. So that is the raw data, okay? And that, so you can see that the raw data is not really normal. It's kind of skewed heavily towards zero. But here you have the distribution of sample means. So this is the mean of a poll of 10 cities. And here this is the real uh, this is the real mean. And you can see that then the um the samples uh mean here are kind of spread 
around, not exactly centered on, but almost centered on at this point, uh, the uh, the actual population mean, okay? So then we have this property that the mean of our sample, so if your data is a sample, your, your mean of your data is a normal, is a, sorry, is a random variable that follows a distribution whose pattern we know. And thanks to the central limit theorem, we know that it should look like uh, a normal deviate, uh, sorry, a normal distribution whose mean will be the mean of the actual original distribution. So that would be that line here. And whose standard deviation depends both on the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n, so the number of points in your sample. Okay, so if we write it mathematically, so the mean of the sample, x bar, follows a normal distribution whose mean is the mean of the population and whose standard deviation is s divided by the square root of n. So basically, that's why also we want to have a larger sample because as you have larger sample, then the standard deviation here becomes smaller. And that means that here, this distribution becomes more and more gathered, concentrated around the real value. So that means that then we have better estimate an average of the actual population mean. That's the whole thing. And because it's a square root relationship, we have sort of a diminishing return, but always better. Okay. And then also note that this only works if the sample size is large enough, uh, as, as I said earlier. And this is the property that is actually hard uh, to hard to judge. Like what is large enough? Is it five? Is it 10? Is it 30? Um, there is here no fixed answer, unfortunately, uh, because it depends on the shape of the original distribution. Um, for some distribution, for instance, if the uh, if the base variable, uh, so if for instance this here was already a normal distribution, then even a sample of size one would be enough to have you know to have the convergence. But uh, if it's not normal, then the farther it is from normal, uh, the more points you need to have actually your mean of the sample being normal. To, or in general, we say that in most case, 20, 30 is enough, but there are some fringe cases where actually it's not. So uh, the best to me is sometimes to play a little bit around with this. So that's what I, for instance, I do here. I play different sample size, 5, 50, and 500. And each time I will sample a lot of time a lot of samples, so 10,000 samples from uh, with these uh, with this number of points in there. So with n equal 5, n equal 50, or n equal 500. And I will plot what their mean look like, OK? And I sample from this, again, ex uh, exponential drop. And I will also plot the theoretical normal low, so what the central limit theorem tells us this should be, OK? So you can see that when your sample size is five, the here the theoretical normal low, if the central limit theorem was uh, was applied, is actually a bit different from the what you actually see when you do the experiment. Okay, when you simulate what would really happen. So here that's a case where the central limit theorem doesn't apply. The sample size is too small in that case. But when the sample size is 50, you can see that there is still a small shift, but we are almost almost there. And then here, yeah, personally, I would be OK with applying uh, and using the theoretical normal low uh, to do my testing. OK, it's close enough. And when the sample size is 500, then you can see that they are overlapping almost uh, perfectly. And that here, the central limit theorem also applies quite well. OK. Does this make sense, all that? Everything's okay. 
Yes. I, I, I still don't get wh why we do that. Why we do that? Uh, yes. so what is the logic behind? Mm -hmm. So the logic is that um, thanks to this property, our um, uh, the behavior of the sample mean becomes a predictable quantity. That means that I would expect like under maybe the null, hy uh, null hypothesis that maybe my mean of the population is some certain value. I would expect my sample mean to follow uh, to follow this theoretical normal law, which I can predict. If I can do a prediction based on an hypothesis, then that means that I can compare the result of an experiment to this prediction, and thus I can make uh, I can test this assumption, and that offers me then the possibility of doing the statistical test of rejecting the hypothesis or whatever, and so of making science advance. This is the whole idea. Does this make more sense? Uh, so he, here with your population, I can see where you get the original data from and where you can test it against. But if if I do in science an experiment, I, do, I don't have this census data, for example, which you are using right now. So, so yes. what do I compare it to? So the idea is that, that you don't have, if you, if you have the population, you don't need statistical testing because you already have result so you're right in science in general we just have your sample and that's why we have to rely on the theoretical part here in science you can't have the blue part you can only have you only have the yellow part the theoretical thing that you use then to compare with your experiment okay and that's why this property is so important because without this property we would not have the yellow line so you would get your result your experimental result but you would not know what to compare them against does this make more sense i need to digest it okay so um it will make i think a bit more sense when we go on to the application of that this afternoon and we talk about statistical testing and so on and so forth for now, it's 12.06, so we are going to go on our lunch break for one hour. And when we come back, there will be a small exercise just about manipulating uh, probabilities, okay? So I will, uh, we'll do that when you come back. Um, if you have any question in the meantime, don't hesitate to write them in the chat and I will try my best again to, to answer them. And uh, otherwise, I wish you a bon appétit. Okay, so our exercise was a case where we imagine that we throw a coin 10 times, and then we record the number of times that we see head appear, and we know that as a frequency. Uh, so if the coin is fair, we presume that the coin is fair, then the expected mean uh, should be 0 0.5, okay, because we have 50% chance of getting hit. And we know also that's just uh, something that we know that uh, the, experience, uh, the expected standard deviation of, uh, of uh, this should be 0 0.5 as well, All right? So that's for kind of the theoretical part uh, of just our coin toss. And then we ask the question, what would be the normal low followed by the mean of this sample of size 10 if the central limit theorem actually applied, okay? So we have here this little function to make some experiments, okay? And we could say, okay, we see sometime we have 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So this varies a bit, okay? And so we can actually, we could make a, a ton of, ex, uh, of experiments there and then see uh, what is the actual, uh, you know, shape of this, uh, of, of, the, of the distribution of the mean of this sample of size 10. But we have the central limit theorem, which already can, without having to repeat this large number of, 
of simulations, which in practice, in the in general, we cannot do. Uh, we can already have a look uh, using the central limit theorem as what this should look like. So if we come back up to this example here, the central limit theorem states that the mean of the sample should have a following normal law that has a mean equal to the mean of the population and a standard deviation, which is equal to the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n, the number of observation in our sample. So here, in our case, that means that the mean should be 0 0.5 and the standard deviation of our of our um, of our uh, of our sample a mean should be this value of 0 0.5 so that's the population standard deviation divided by the square root so this oops right right up of n and so n in our case is 10 okay so here we have yeah, square root of 10. So we can then print M N S just go. And so that's the idea. So in theory, according to the central limit theorem, the mean of this experiment should follow a um, sorry, a, a normal distribution whose mean is 0 0.5 and whose square uh, whose uh, standard deviation is about 0 0.16 okay so that's what the central limit theorem states right so that's for question one so far so good yes okay so here we have to disconnect the the, the the property of the of the population so the mean of the population standard deviation of the population and then apply on that n the number like the size of our sample so that's the theory now we can ask the very important question is the uh, clt actually good enough to be applied here i will not write the code from scratch uh, so as not to take too much time so here the idea is that we have let's say the luxury of being able to just apply uh, applying some some simulation there in practice on your data oftentimes you will not be able to do that okay this is a luxury that we are aware that because we are using a very simple example but i want to use that to help give you a little bit of a small intuition of how we could go about testing sort of assumption because then in practice we cannot do that so it's, it's good to build just a repertoire of small method of small ideas about having like how you know when does uh, this uh, theorem apply when it might not and what you should look for so okay our sample size is 10 our expected mu is usually how we note the population mean so expected mean is 0 0.5 expected standard deviation is 0 0.5 divided by the square root of the sample size then i will sample 100 means okay not too many but right and then my normal approximation so the one stated by the um theoretical uh normal law from the central limit theorem is given there so it's a norm whose location is the mu and scale is expected standard deviation and it so happens that uh, I know also about the theoretical binomial distribution there because uh, of how the problem is set. I know that this mean is in reality following that distribution. So I can also compare the normal uh, law given by the CLT, which is an approximation, and the actual one, which I know in practice it will actually follow. And then I can compare that with the empirical result of randomly sampling some means. And then I plot this. Okay, so this is what this looks like. Okay, and so you can sort of see. So in blue, you have the empirical sample. Okay, in green, you have the theoretical from the binomial. So this one, I know it is 
the actual theoretical, which is true. And then you have in yellow, you have the normal approximation that is given to you by the central limit theorem. And so from that, now we can try and judge. When you see this, what do you think? Do you think that the central limit theorem is kind of good enough here or that it's not good enough? So if you think it's good enough, please use a red uh, green tick. And you think if you think it's not good here, please use a red cross. Okay, so, so far a majority of green tick and one red cross. Okay, so uh, for the people who have put a red cross, or even if you didn't put a red cross, if you think that it should not apply, can you write in the chat if you feel like it, uh, why you think that is? Or you can just speak up. So here we are comparing kind of this blue line there with the with the yellow one. So we could also say, okay, maybe a sample of 100 means is not enough. So we could maybe sample a few more, 10,000. And then we kind of see now this. So here, if we focus a bit on that, you see that it's a bit strange because we are sampling something in a um, in a discrete fashion, if you will. Uh, so that means that then the plotting becomes a bit weird. All right. So we have to kind of abstract a little bit around that. And if if you do so, uh, you will you would see that this actually are follows fairly closely what we uh, expect. Let me see if I can just tune a little bit here my east plot and I think that I can change the bin width to 0 0.1. Uh, that should be a bit better, hopefully. Well, not really. Uh, I was unlucky there, one, one, one. Should be about the same scale, but unfortunately there are some rounding errors there that, uh, that creates some issue, but you can see with the density there that we have something that actually follow the same distribution. And here you see that the binomial law there is very close to the normal approximation here. Um, maybe to convince ourselves of that, it will be much more obvious in a larger sample size because so discretization will be less of a problem there. Can we, ah, of course, then the bin width is now not appropriate. So we should have something like this. Ah, I'm sorry. I think I made, ah, yes. Sampling mean here should be changed as well and equal sample size. Okay, so we can play around with these different parameters. Now it takes a bit more time to sample, of course. And we still have this uh, small uh, small discrepancy between the between the two. I'm sorry, I'm not able to uh, make it visually compelling there. So I'm going to go back to 10. And we are back there. And here, in fact, what we see is that we have the same uh, the same sort of shape, the same sort of frequency. And so here it so happens that even with a sample size fairly small, 10, the approximation is actually not, not too bad. Uh, you can see that, and in particular, you can see that uh, the actual binomial law is very close to the normal approximation from the central limit theorem. All right. Okay, so far so good. So my question is, um, the, the matter is the actual binomial law should uh, follow the, um, the the real data, or, so or the, we we match we match the blue line with the with the with the yellow line. Yeah. So here, yeah, here due to some discretization problem because 
uh, this is a discrete distribution. Uh, the blue line doesn't match, uh, like at least the histogram doesn't match too much, but you can see that the KDE line actually matches relatively well the uh, the other two. The blue line is what we see empirically with 100 random sample, but of course there is some randomization in there because it's empirically drawn. Uh, the red, uh, the sorry, the green dots is the actual binomial law, the one which I know that this follows uh, without any approximation. So if I were to repeat, uh, if I were to repeat that an infinite number of time, I would expect exactly what you observe with the with the green dots here. And then the yellow line is the is the normal approximation. So ideally, you would want to have this yellow line close to the uh, close to the close to the green points. In practice, in general, you don't really have the green points. So you have to compare the yellow line to the uh, to the blue line, okay, with mm -hmm. some simulations. And most of the case, you will not even be able to uh, to do some empirical draw. And so you will not even have the luxury of the blue line. You will just have to trust the central limit theorem. Okay. That's the kind of, if you will, way that this works. Okay, more questions? All right, so then let's get on. So this idea is that, okay, thanks to that, we have now some theoretical properties about the mean of the sample that lets us do some prediction. In particular, we can, we know what, you know, what is the pattern of randomness that they are supposed to follow? That means that now we are able to make it, make a judgment of whether a particular observation was very likely or very unlikely, given the theoretical distribution that it's supposed to follow. Okay. This is sort of the idea of saying, okay, I have some knowledge about the size that human have, I know that, okay, maybe the mean should be somewhere around uh, 170 or 165, depending on uh, sex in particular. I know that this should vary broadly between 1.2 meter and maybe 2 meter 10. And so from this knowledge, from this expectation that I have, if someone says to me that they have seen a human that was three meter tall, I would find that fairly unbelievable. All right. So this is here the same idea that we will do. We will say, okay, we have, thanks to the central limit theorem, expectations under certain, you know, hypothesis about what our sample mean should be. And then that will be useful to help us make judgment call about the likelihood of what we are actually seeing when we do experiments. So in particular, we can start uh, using a tool which we use a lot, which is the confidence interval uh, around a either sample mean or around a population mean. So here the idea is that you want to create an interval centered around your mean such that it contains 95% of the probability density. I would just do a small visual. Oh. Yep. I will do a small visualization there. I think it will work much better. So basically you have your, your draws here and you want to have here this area here in orange that contains 95% of the probability density. So you see it's focused on the part where the density is the highest. And then you want to have 5% outside of this. So of course, because you have it's symmetrical, so you have 2.5% to the left and 2.5% to the right. And these 95% confidence interval have a fairly uh, nice uh, property is uh, that if you imagine that you have a theoretical mean of here one standard deviation of one, um, 
with the uh, with the theoretical normal law, you can kind of predict with a 95% confidence interval that 95% of the means of uh, of the sample that you draw will find with will fall within this confidence interval, and thus 5% will fall outside. Of course, we can then test that. Say we have a mean of one, standard deviation of one, sample size 500. Thus, from that we can derive what would be the theoretical law followed by these uh, by the sample mean. Okay, so that's the mean and then standard deviation be, uh, divided by square root of the sample size. And we can then use this theoretical property to predict the 95% confidence interval of my uh, of my uh, population mean and say, okay, I predict that 95% of the sample mean should fall between, you know, in this confidence interval there, which I compute with the PPF function. So percent point function as a way of computing the quantile. So the 2.5% and 97.5% quantile of this theoretical uh, normal law that I obtained with the central limit theorem. And then I will test that so that I will sample 10,000 mean there with this sample size. And I will check how many indeed fall within or uh, outside of the confidence interval. And what you can see here is that out of the 10,000 sample mean, I have 9,000, uh, sorry, yeah, 9,505. So 95.05, which indeed fall within the confidence interval there that I computed with the central limit theorem. Okay, and thus about 5% that find uh, that fall outside just by its chance. So far, so good. Yes. Okay. So this is a, let's say, central uh, property of this confidence interval, and that's where we can see that the, you know, uh, the central limit theorem and the way that it lets us do some prediction of what we should see when we do as the experiment can be useful, and this can then also be kind of reversed. Uh, and the idea is to say now we reverse the thing. We won't compute this, the confidence interval on the population mean, because in practice, we don't know that population mean. We will compute the 95% confidence interval on the sample mean, okay? which is most of the time what we do. And we will ask the question, when I draw a random sample, how many times does its confidence interval actually contain the, uh, the population mean, which I know here because I am doing the simulation. And here you will see that it's actually also the same thing. Here, about 95% of the time, the real mean is found within the confidence interval of my sample mean. So that's a nice reflective property there. And that's what lets us compute the 95 confidence interval. And that's also why we call that a 95% confidence interval, okay? All right, so far so good. When we had this property. Yes, no, unsure. Let me know if there is anything still very weird there because there is an exercise coming. All right, so um, a few functions then to manipulate all of these uh, theoretical distribution. I've used them here and there. So the PDF or PMF, PDF for continuous, PMF for discrete, will return the density at a particular point. The CDF returns the probability of doing this value or lower than this value, okay? So if you want the probability of drawing, I don't know, let's say here, the probability of doing 0.95 or less, you would call stats.norm.cdf of 0.95 and PPF, you get you get the quantile. So then you give it a, a, a fraction here 
and you get the value at which you have only this fraction lower. So here, PPF of 0 0.025 would return to you the value such that you have 2.5% of the density to your under you. Okay, so for instance, that's uh, that's oops, sorry, dot norm dot ppf. I will use my standard normal law with a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. And if I take the quantile two point five percent of this uh, of this law, I should get minus one point ninety six. Okay which is kind of a, let's say, canonical value, uh, 1.96 and minus 1.96 that we use to uh, to have approximate 95% confidence interval for a standard normal law. All right, so that's how we use them in, let's say, practice. Okay, so now your turn to work. So we say we take kind of the same experiment as before. Okay, we have 10 coins. We throw them and we count the number of time we find head. As we have seen before, this is a case where the normal approximation for the central limit theorem works. And we know that uh, in theory, they are supposed to follow this, like, uh, this, uh, this law where the expected the mean is 0 0.5 and the standard deviation is 0 0.5 divided by the sample size, so 10, okay? So we have our, you know, expectation there, provided that the coin is fair. And now I'm just going to say, okay, I do the experiment and I find seven times head. And now I'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions about, um, how likely this result is. So what is the probability of obtaining this result? How, li how likely, so what is the probability of having found at most seven heads? So that means uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. Then at least seven or more, and so on and so forth. Uh, around this, this. So it's now we want to relate one observation, one empirical observation with the expected according to the theory. Okay, so your turn to play. Uh, and as usual, don't hesitate to ask questions. And now we are going to go through the correction together. So we have seen already question one, how likely was the result? So who, what was the probability of obtaining seven heads out of 10? Toin cos, uh, cos toin, not toin, yeah, off. And, uh, and then we answer the question, how likely was it to get come up with at most seven heads? Provided, again, provided that the coin is fair. I repeat, provided that the coin is fair, it's very important because if we don't presume that the coin is fair, that we don't have a value here for P, and so we cannot make prediction, all right? Later on, when we will have this sort of thing, we will talk about our null hypothesis. Our null hypothesis here is that the coin is fair. So, um, question three. So, question three is then we say how likely we're going to come up with at least seven heads. Okay, so now before it was at most seven and now it's at least seven heads. That means probability of doing uh, seven, eight, nine, or 10. Okay, so here we could do something like, something like this. For instance, we do probability uh, mass function of seven plus the one of getting eight plus blah, blah, blah. But there's a, nicer way to do that. So CDF only gives you the value of doing, the probability of doing one value or less. However, there is, remember, one nice little property uh, there is that the total sum of all the probabilities will always be one. And that's something that we can use to our advantage there because we know 
that the probability of doing seven or more is one minus the probability of doing the reverse, that is at most six. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, super. So we can sort of have this, all right? And doing six or less is quite easy because that's actually just something that we can give to the CTF function. So we have that probability, probability of doing six or less, and we just do one minus that, and voila, we have the 0 0.17, so 17%. That's the probability of doing seven, eight, nine, or 10. Okay, so, so far so good. Who was able to find that? I know this ask a little bit of a, like kind of, you know, reversing trick one minus. There's a question by Ahmed. No, no, just um, when you said that you who come up with that. So uh, I, I just used, uh, instead of one, mm -hmm. I just used the, the last 10, which, um, but yours, your, but yours is more uh, is more logic. Yeah, no, it's it's. But that should be so. That would be something like. Yeah, exactly. I did that like this. Yeah, that that works as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. Cool. So okay, we have that. So now we have okay probability of doing less and probability of doing more. Okay, or at most, at least. Now we come up with this weird question. Who likely were we to come up with a result at least as different from the expected mean of five? Okay, so now the question is very tortured, right? So we want to come up with a result which is at least as different from the expected mean of seven. So at least as different from five. So if we have seven, the difference to the mean of five is two. So we want something which is at least as different as seven, all right? So there we can kind of list what is maybe more different uh, than five, uh, more different to five than seven. So we have zero, one, two, three, then three is exactly as different uh, because the difference is two. And then we have seven, eight, nine, and 10. Okay, so we want the probability of doing either of these. So far, so good. Yes, okay. Don't hesitate to stop me at this point because I know that the formulation can be a bit weird. So, now we want, we cannot get that in one go. We will go first this and then that. So the first is given to us by the CDF of three. Okay, so CDF of three. Okay, and the second part is what we just computed because this gives us the probability of doing seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so then we have. On one hand, we have that, and on the other hand, we have this, okay? And so here, we have 34 persons. So that's the probability of obtaining something which is at least as different from this expected mean of five than what we observed seven heads, okay? And now we could ask the question, so this was the last one, how about if you come up with only one head out of 10? And so up, we can actually do the same, but now to have something at least as different, it's only zero and one and nine and 10, which are at least as different. So CDF of one, and here we have uh, eight, if I'm not mistaken. One minus eight, so that we have nine and 10. That works. And we get here 2% only probability of being at least as different. 
And now my question to you, that was the very last one. Do you think that the coin is fair in that case? So you throw a coin 10 times and you find only one time it gives you head. And you have now so this information there, this probability. And I asked you, do you think that the coin is fair? Or do you think that the coin is not fair? Uh, if you think that the coin is fair, please vote with a little green tick. If you think that the coin is not fair, please put a red cross. Uh, excuse me, can you please just explain again? So we need we need um, a result that has uh, the same difference between seven and five, right? Yes, yes. So that's at least the same difference. So then one. So for instance, zero is more different. So we include that, but two is less different. So that's not part of this probability. So two and two and up. It's like two, so, three, four, and five, five. Yeah, so, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight are less different than the result of one. They are less extreme if you want. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Uh, still, I still I didn't get it exactly. So um, there, we have seven heads, whereas the mean, which is five, is two. So yeah. um, we need we need differences more, less uh, like two or more, right? Yes, exactly. So that, that's this example there, and so that's why we want two or more, and that's why we include zero point two, uh, zero one two three, and seven eight nine ten. Mm -hmm. And now we are in the other case where we found only one head. And so in that case, to be at least as different, we need, we have only 0, 1, and 9, and 10. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I see that in the vote, most people voted to, uh, to say that the coin was not fair. Okay, so you take a coin, you throw it 10 times, you find one head, and then you conclude the coin is not fair. I know write in the chat what do you think this quantity is and how this led to your to your decision if you if you have the intuition for what is this probability that we just computed how we call that in statistics Okay, so this probability is exactly the this. This is a p-value. So well played. This is indeed a p-value. So our, in our case, we make an experiment, and our null hypothesis is uh, up hypothesis is that p is equal to 0 0.5 and our then p value is the probability of obtaining a result at least as extreme so as far away from the expected mean than the one that we observed during our experiment okay so p value is proba of being as extreme or more than observed and there's a null hypothesis okay so the smaller the p-value the smaller the probability of being more extreme than what we observed the more unlikely our result here our you know observed result was if the null was true and so the idea is that you presume that the that the null hypothesis tells you that but if you observe something that is very very far away from what you you expected and provided that there were no like problems when recording the data of course then you say that this is an argument this strong argument to say that your null hypothesis is maybe not true rosario you have a question yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, in this last example we did uh, with this with the p value, uh, 
Mm -hmm. I don't see how this, or I didn't understand how this and the previous example where we do the range of probability higher than two are the same. Because here we are stating that uh, it's just one time we get head, or we should say that we get head or tail once. Mm, we we uh, so so if we don't get head, we get tail, kind of by definition. So here the idea is we. In that last case, we throw the coin 10 times and we get nine times tail and only one times head. Yep. And we ask. But here in the question, we say that we need to find one head and nine tails, right? Mm, yes. Okay. No, I, ju I just don't get, I didn't get why we had to include the other probability. Of the being, other. Of, being uh, of being zero and nine and 10? Yes, why nine and ten if we want to have just one option? I thought it was just zero and one. I don't know. Maybe I some so Sorry. Uh, ah yes, just zero and one versus uh zero, one, nine, and ten, right? Yes. Yes. So uh that's actually a very good uh, remark. So when each time we compute the p-value for a when we do a test and so on and so forth, we have the choice of doing a two-sided test or one-sided test. So in a two-sided test, we say that the null hypothesis is that the probability is 0, 5, and that the alternative, so our h1, and we'll use this notation, is that p is just different from 0, 0.5, but it could be above or under, OK? We, we don't make any pre judgment on that, OK? So that's the two-sided uh, case, and that's usually the default one. But there is a, another uh, possibility that you say that the alternative could be one-sided. So we say the probability is under 0 0.5. And so in that case, you would only test for the under case. So you would only test for here 0 and 1 and not for 9 and 10. And this is a choice that has to be made kind of by the experimenter in the end. Does that make more sense? Yes, thank you. It's just that uh, I thought that since we didn't state like I was seeing nine and ten, like the probability we will get one tail and and nine heads, while we were asking for getting one head and nine tails. So I thought I saw it like two different uh, hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they are in this kind of. Okay, okay. I just want to yeah, sure. Okay, so I will paste this in the chat. All right, so that everyone has it. And otherwise, of course, everything is in here, the solution that you can load. So for instance, you can, yeah, you can have this different information plus a little bit of the of the reason of why we compute this and that. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm a little bit confused now. Ah, uh, go ahead. So uh, we here say zero, one, nine, ten, and these numbers are the numbers of the heads, right? Not the tails. Yeah. Heads. I'm uh, here. I'm only counting the number of heads. Okay, great. So now I'm confused. So what did zero one like one or less uh, heads, and then I don't know why we included the nine ten because we only need um, one head. Um, yeah, here we say that our we our, we presume what we presume is that uh, the 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 coin is fair. Okay, if the coin is unfair, so that's our alternative hypothesis, uh, it could be unfair in two ways. It could be unfair biased toward uh, toward head or unfair biased toward tail. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so that's why we include both sides. When we say that we 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 say that uh, the coin could be unfair or biased in the two directions. So that's why there is the there is a two sides if you will uh include it and if it is fair should uh, the, the result should be uh, 0.5 right the result should be 
0.5, but we know that there is some randomness, right? So when you yeah. do statistical experiments, you say, okay, you find 0.4. Is this enough to declare that it's unfair? You find seven. Is it is it enough? Here, the p-value would be 34%. So you would say, ah, it's maybe not enough to declare that it's unfair. Doesn't maybe, that doesn't tell you if it's unfair or not. It just says that you don't have enough uh, information mm -hmm. there to conclude. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Do not hesitate to ask more questions. Uh, this is the, let's say, maybe the hardest part where we do the most like simple basic math. But that's also, as you can see, we build up, that's where we build up to the whole theoretical reason why we do testing and how testing work. Like that's when we kind of open a little bit the hood. And if you understand this, then the rest should follow without too much difficulty because this is just an application of these principles there. Okay, so as I said, do not hesitate to come back to these later on if you are unsure about stuff. Because now from there, we see that we move from this consideration about this distribution and how knowing about this distribution helps us put some expectation so we can then put forward one null hypothesis. And then we say, okay, if this null hypothesis, I know something about how a theoretical sample should behave. And so then by comparing our expectation with our observation or reality, we can make a judgment with respect to our hypothesis up to a point. So in statistical hypothesis text testing, we have this, our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. Okay, there are statements about the real world, how we think, uh, think uh, things could work. Our null hypothesis helps us define a test statistic and its expected behavior under the null hypothesis. So this is the theoretical law given here by this stats.binom or by the uh, normal law given by the central limit theorem. And then we actually perform the experiment. It gives us our like measured metric, our measured number. And by comparing that with the expectation under the null hypothesis, we obtain the likelihood, if you will, that uh, that what we have seen is is probable under the null hypothesis. Okay, so a test statistic is is something that you can compute from your sample. So let's say the most common one could be the mean of your sample, and then to put that in the frame of uh, of many testing system. A lot of the time, we actually do a few small transformation on this mean to make it comparable with a standard low, such as a standard uh, normal low centered on zero and uh, with a standard deviation of one. So it often comes down to what we are going to just see. Let's imagine that we have n measure, we sample n measure from a normal low say that we know that it's a normal low. The mean is unknown uh, and we put it at M and the variance is known. Okay, that's far from the usual case, but we start with something very simple and then we see the case where it's unknown. So this should follow then a normal low of I mean M and standard deviation sigma. So that's the theoretical uh, mean of the population. Our null hypothesis would be that the unknown mean of the population would be equal to a reference value. Okay, maybe this reference value comes from another study or you know whatever. Alternative hypothesis is that this is then different. This is two-sided. It could be different above or different under. According to the central limit theorem, okay, we know that the mean of this sample of n measure should follow this distribution there. So the mean of the sample will have a mean of M, so the mean of the population, and a standard deviation, which is a standard deviation of the population, 
divided by square root of n number of observations in our sample. So under the null hypothesis, presuming that m equal m0, then this sample mean should follow that low there. Okay, so see if I've switched the m for m0 because the null hypothesis states that m equal m0. So far, so, so far, so good. Yep, okay. So now to kind of make it, uh, to make it comparable with a standard distribution, I will here take this normal uh, distribution in if I remove the expected mean and divide by the expected standard deviation, then I should shift from this normal distribution there to the standard one with mean zero and standard deviation one. Okay, so that's very simple center and scale operation to make it something super standard. And so thus my test statistic is the sample mean minus the expected mean divided by the expected standard deviation. And this test statistic under the null hypothesis should behave like a standard normal low. And so then by comparing this metric here, this test statistic with, uh, with the standard normal low, I can compute a p-value. So now we say, okay, let's have M zero equal one, sigma equal two. Let's say we collected 100 measure and our sample mean is 1.42. If we do this little computation, we would get a test statistic of 2.1. And then we can ask the question, how likely was it to observe at you know something like 2.1 under this standard normal low? So this comes down to this, okay, we have our, standard normal low centered on zero, standard deviation of one. And then all the area in red is whatever is larger than 2.1 or minus 2.1. Okay, remember we are two-sided in our alternative there. And so here I can again use the same thing, the CDF and have the probability of being extreme under and probability of being extreme above. And I thus get my p-value of 0 0.036, so 3.6%, yeah. Okay, so that's what we have just seen, but now it's in this uh, sort of null hypothesis testing and with a normal distribution. And so then is we have this part about either two-sided or one-sided tests. So if our standard uh, if our alternative hypothesis is not that it's different, but that it is maybe greater. So we restrict our test to only cases where it's greater. Then we can have a slightly different way of computing our p-value, which only takes into account this part there and not that part. That part is not part of the alternative hypothesis anymore, all right? And there now our p-value is 1.7%. Okay, so there you go. Uh, that's just a reframing of what we've just seen. So from that, from this very, very simple test, which uses the assumption, which is not very uh, uh, realistic that we know the theoretical variance in the population, we can shift toward maybe one of the most, oh, sorry, one of the most uh, well-known statistical tests, and this is the t-test, which tests the difference between two means. So here we are now in just the case where it's the same thing as before, but we do not know the standard deviation. It is not known in advance, and so because we don't know it in advance, this adds a layer of uncertainty, if you will. Okay, you, you had a new layer of uncertainty to your to your model is that you have to now estimate the standard deviation on top of the rest. And just this new layer of uncertainty means that the 
the test statistic stays the same, but we know from the theory, we know that it does not follow a standard normal uh, law, but it follows a T distribution with a new parameter, which is the degrees of freedom. And this value is equal to N, so number of observation minus one. So I will show you a normal distribution and a T distribution. So you see the normal distribution in blue. And then the T distribution, you can see here, what happens is that the central part is a bit less likely and the tails are a bit heavier there. They are a bit more likely. So the T distribution is like a normal distribution, but where you make events which are unlikely a bit more probable. It's a bit more probable to uh, to uh, to have extreme events, okay? And so that's the effect of this added layer of uncertainty uh, when you have to also estimate the variance because you don't know it in advance. So here it's with a degree of freedom of three. If the degree of freedom was one, then you see maybe the tail is even bigger. Actually, let me do something like this, 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 one, yeah. And then one. And you see here with one, you have even, uh, even bigger tails there. But if my degree of freedom was maybe 100, so I have a lot of observations, then the T distribution becomes very, very, very close to the normal distribution, up to the point that we used to say that when N is above 30, the T distribution is you know close enough that we can use a normal uh, approximation. That was the case when we didn't have computer to compute all of these for us. Nowadays, you don't want to use the approximation, but if you only have pen and papers, then the approximation is good. All right, so now things have not changed much. It's just that we will use this T distribution there to compute our p-value. And we also have then to compute our uh, degrees of freedom there, normally it's with n minus one, but things can get slightly more complex. I will directly show you the, let's say, more modern version of the t-test, the one that doesn't presume an equality of variance between the two groups and the one where you don't have to have the same amount of uh, sample in both groups, okay? So our null hypothesis, if we say that we have two population of mean mu1 and mu2, and we sample n1 and n2 individual in both populations, and thus we have then now two samples, one from population one, one from population two. The first has a mean x1, the other x2, and the observed standard deviation s1 and s2. Our null hypothesis is that the population, the mean of the populations are the same. Okay. The alternative is that they are different. And we have now a number of assumptions for that test. The first is that the central limit theorem applies. If it does not apply, then we cannot make this normal approximation there. We cannot use the t-distribution. We have to use something different. That usually will be the case if you have enough sample, like maybe more than 10, more than 20. Again, depends a little bit on the specifics of your, of your distribution. So I cannot give you an absolute rule here. And also very important, the data should be sampled independently from one another in the two population being compared. Our test statistic now with all of this information is not exactly the same as before, but I guess maybe you can see a few similarities. It's something that has to do with the means. So here's the difference in mean between our two populations divided by something that depends on the standard deviation and the number of observations there. So here it's the variance 
in sample one, so standard deviation squared, divided by number of observation, plus the standard deviation in population two and sample two, divided by number of individual in sample two. Okay, so it's sort of kind of, if you will, an average between uh, this, uh, this uh, standard deviation of both, uh, of both samples. And these are computed like this. They are exactly like uh, the standard deviation that you know. So they are difference between each point and the mean divided by the number of individual in the sample. But there is a little minus one here. Okay, so it's not exactly like the normal standard deviation. And this minus one here is to reflect this added uncertainty uh, which is added by the fact that we estimate uh, the um, the standard deviation, okay? If you don't put this minus one, you will tend to underestimate uh, the standard deviation. So we have to correct for that. And the proper correction is just this little minus one here. And finally, last but not least, our degree of freedom is this sort of our case here. Uh, which depends mostly on n, but uh, with a little bit of scaling uh, due to the standard deviation, okay? We don't have to focus on the, let's say the details here. The most important just part to remember is that this is just something that depends on the size of both sample and a little bit on their, on their standard deviation as well. Usually we just, you know, apply this formula because there is a very rich, body of literature that has demonstrated mathematically that this was the actual proper uh, proper way to compute that in this case. So we take this, and now we will try that with an example, of course. So I have here some uh, data that was collected on some mice, which have a different, which were subjected to different diet and may also come from different uh, genotype, and we collected weight data on these mice. So let me show that to you. So we do here a small violin plot, and we have here some mice whose, then we have our HFD and chow diet. And you see here that the mice under the HFD diet might on average be bigger, weight more than the mice on the chow diet. And we ask ourselves, is this actually the case? So what I do then is here I will do it manually and then I will show it show to you how to do that automatically. So I will just take this data and apply this exact formula on them. Okay. I separate them both with uh, you know I want the mice on the chow and mice on the HFD diet. I get their weight. N1 and N2 is just the length of these, then the mean uh, are also gaps there, so that's my x1 and x2. Then I want a variance there, and here there is this little ddof equal one, so that's the delta degree of freedom, and that takes care of this little minus one here when I compute this value, which I will then need here and there. And then here, this sort of little or there is just me applying this formula here. So difference of mean divided by square root of the sigma square for group one divided by n1 plus sigma square of group two divided by n2. So this is exactly that translated in code. And the number of degree of freedom is this uh, little bit of code there. I will leave it to you if you are curious to go and check my code to verify that I've not made any mistake, if you are curious. So I have got my test statistic and I will then compare this test statistic with a T distribution with this amount of degree of freedom, a mean of zero and standard deviation of one because I have centered and scaled. So that's how I get that stats.t, so it's not stat.norm, but stat.t because of this estimation of standard deviation, which had this high degree of uh, uncertainty. And then the CDF, 
of minus my test statistic and one minus my test statistic here. Okay, so remember this is two sided, so I want what's on the left and what's on the right. I apply this, I compute a test statistic of minus seven. The degree of freedom estimated there is 44, and that corresponds to a p value of 9.24 times 10 to the power minus 10. And of course, we won't ask you to do that in practice, okay? That's something which exists already that has been coded. So stats.ttest of independent, ttest underscore ind, you give the data for group one, the data for group two. You say that you don't presume that the variants are equal. So not presume that means that the variants are equal is why we have to use this slightly barbaric expression there. But it's nice because you have one less assumption for your test. And then we get a test statistic, which is exactly what I had, and a p-value, which is also the same. So I've not made any mistake, apparently. So this function will return to use the test statistic and the p-value. OK. So now, quick question to you, if everything is good so far. Given this result, what would be your conclusion? So green tick, if you would accept a uh, H0, or at least fail to reject H0, and red cross if, given this p-value, you decide to reject H0 and say that the mice have different, significantly different mean. Let's have a little vote with the reactions. Okay, some reject, some accept. Okay. Okay, so most people reject. And indeed, in that particular case, we would tend to reject H0 and say that they have significantly different mean there between these two populations because the p-value is 9 uh, times 10 to the power 10. So it's about 1 divided by 1 billion. Okay, so that's actually very, 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 very small. It was very unlikely to see such a result under the null hypothesis, all right? And what we would do also would be maybe on top of this p-value, you would want to report the actual difference between means, okay? So you would want to maybe say the mean between, the mean difference, uh, difference between the mean of these two samples is eight gram, 8.4 grams which is approximately, you know, uh, one, one twenty-five percent of the weight of the mice, right? Give or take. Uh, so that's actually uh, far from negligible, right? That's a significant difference, not only statistically, but also biologically, when you have a difference of mass of 25%. Okay. And then if the p-value was 0 0.3, I will give that to you. Here, if the p-value was 0 0.3, we would say that we fail to reject H0. We would say, okay, here it was not so unlikely that we observe that under the null hypothesis just by chance. And so we would conclude that we don't reject H0. Here we don't say that we accept H0. We just say that we don't reject it because this, uh, a, a high p-value could come also from the fact that you don't have enough sample. Like if the difference is small, it might still exist, but you would need a lot of sample to be able to detect it. I will go in that uh, in more detail a bit later on, but I want to tease. Okay, how are we doing so far? Is everything kind of making sense now that we have seen where we wanted to go when what was this context for the test and so on and so forth? I think I think it'd be at least for me, I need some time to digest all all, all of this. Uh, yeah. So it, 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 it looks it looks okay, but I mm -hmm. think 
to, to understand everything, I need time to, to, to digest. Sure. It needs, I mean, yeah, it, it needs some for me. Uh, you need, we all need some time to meditate on these concepts, uh, some time for them to make complete sense. Um, if I can just guide uh, this, the process, yeah, I think it's more important to focus on the concepts of the assumption of the test and how we have created a setup such that we have expectation and there's a null hypothesis and what we have done here and in this previous test. I think this is more important to having a broad understanding of, of all of this than the particulars of this formula. This formula, the, they are particulars. We could go into the details of them, but that's far beyond the scope of that course here. We will just use what the literature uh, gives to us and focus more on the test, what their null hypothesis say, and what are their assumptions, okay? And it's very important to realize that a p-value is only as good as the you know as the null hypothesis and the assumption of the test allow them to be, because the p-value is directly is directly defined by the assumption that we can make from the null hypothesis and the assumption of the test. So uh, there is a question by Rosario. What is the null hypothesis in the mice weight example? So the null hypothesis is here that the weight, the average weight of the mice are the same between the two population. Okay. And we say that these are like kind of the sample, uh, the, sorry, these are the, that would be the population. So that means imagine that here I only have 20 something mice per category, but I would imagine that I have like an, an infinite number of mice for each category, then their weight, their average weight would coincide. That would be my null hypothesis. Does that make sense? Okay. Perfect. So then. As we say, all right, we have a test. It has a null hypothesis and some assumption about the properties of uh, what we collect. And that is thanks to these that we are able to compute the p-value. If we don't make this null hypothesis and if we don't have this assumption that we cannot compute the p-value. And thus, a contrario, if the assumptions are not respected, then the p-value entirely loses its meaning, okay? That is, for example, why when we call this, we have this option equal var equal false or equal var equal true because there is two ways of doing the t-test. One which presumes equality of variance, but then the formula are not the same. And thus, if our variance were not equal, but we would say that equal var equal true, we would presume false thing, we would make false assumption. And so the p-value would not have a proper meaning. It would lose its meaning, it would be useless. Here we say equal var equal false. We don't presume equality of variance. And thus we are in a slightly different mathematical uh, you know, formula. We use something slightly different. And then, only then does the p-value make sense in this uh, case. So here, if we come back a little bit to the assumption of the test that we have just done, the first is that the data used to carry out the test should be sampled independently from the two population being compared. That one, you should take care of that when you design the experiment. For instance, here, these are entirely different mice. And second, the mean of each sample should be normally distributed, okay? The assumption is not necessarily that the sample are normally distributed, but that they are mean R. That means that even if the sample are not normally distributed, if we have enough point, the central limit theorem, ensure that their mean will be super close to normally distributed and usually close enough that you know we don't have to care too much and the p-value is still meaningful. 
However, <coughs> it's more easily said than done. So for instance, we can illustrate a little bit. I will take a case where I take two samples from the same distribution. So I'm now respecting the null hypothesis, okay, because they have the same theoretical mean. So when I then do some random testing, I should get sometimes things which are significantly different just by chance. And most of the time, I should get something which is not significantly different because the null hypothesis in my case is true. Okay. And furthermore, we could say that according to its kind of definition, I should see p values under 0 0.05 exactly 5% of the time. Okay. There will be a little bit of randomness around that because I'm doing some random simulation, but we should be fairly close to that. Here I'm doing 10,000 repetitions, so that should be close. I will do it once with when I draw from a normal distribution. So this is kind of, if you will, the perfect case where all the assumptions are respected. And then I will do that a second time with another distribution a Pareto distribution, uh, which is quite uh, different from uh, the normal distribution. In particular, it gives a lot of very extreme results. And there we will see if our assumption that only 5% of the p-values will be significant is still respected or not. So just to see what is the effect of breaching the assumption, here I breached the assumption that a sample comes from a normal distribution as on the p-value. So I do my simulation. Maybe I should have launched that. No, okay, it goes fast, so that's cool. So when I draw from a normal law, I respect the assumption. Here, the proportion of sample p-value under 0 0.05 is 0 0.45, 46. So that's actually very close to the expected. You can see here in green, the distribution of p-values when I draw from the normal distribution. And you see that it's close to uniform, which is what is expected under the null hypothesis, okay? Because then the p-value follows, uh, you know, uh, the, the, sorry, the test statistic follows its theoretical uh, expectation under the null hypothesis. And so it's equally likely to get any result in terms of p-value. Then when I use a Pareto distribution, then the proportion of sample p-value which are under 0.05 is only 1.7%. So there is now a huge skew, there is a deformation there, and so the p-value that I compute has lost its meaning. When I see a p-value of 0 0.05, it should not be interpreted at 0 0.05, it, it's actually not the correct meaning for it, okay? Uh, so I am now kind of lost with respect to how I should interpret it. And you can see kind of what the distribution of p-values when I draw from a Pareto distribution is. Now it's something weird and it's definitely not what was expected. So that's the effect that breaching the uh, assumption of the test can have. It makes the p-value lose its meaning entirely. All right. So we have to be mindful of this sort of stuff. And it's, I think, again, one of the very, very important concepts to remember. A p-value is only as good as, you know, it's null hypothesis and assumption. And so it's very important before we do any kind of testing to test the assumption as much as possible. And that means that before we do testing, we have to do testing. Okay, so far so good. I know there's a lot of information. Um, I'm not sure with the um, p-value, like under the, if you assume you have a normal distribution, mm -hmm. why are, have they all like the same likelihood, like the green one? Yes. So um, basically, so the p-value gives you the probability of being uh, equally or more extreme than what you expect under the uh, the, the kind of the, the null hypothesis. Uh, so 
here, if we respect the null hypothesis, that's the case here because I draw them from the same thing, then this uh, test statistic will be will follow exactly the uh, the theoretical uh, distribution. So let's take a curve so that it's a bit nicer. Yeah, so it will follow exactly, for instance, that distribution. Okay, and so that means that uh, if it follows this distribution, then I I know that in five percent of the case, I should get something which is equal or under that value. If that is the five percent, uh, if that is the the, the five percent uh, percentile of this distribution, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is the definition of it. So that's true for five percent, but that's also true then for ten percent. I have a ten percent chance of being equal or under the ten percent uh, quantile, fifteen percent, twenty percent, twenty-five, and so on. So for any quantile, I have a proper probability of being under that thing, which is equal to that quantile. So far, so good. Yeah, makes sense. And because this is the p-value then the probability of a particular p-value is actually uh, is actually always kind of, if you will, the same and equal to itself. Okay. Uh, yeah. To itself, but it's equal. And so that means that, and those are all, that's why you see this sort of uniform. Mm, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. You're welcome. That's a nice little, uh, let's say, uh, property and that's sometimes that's why I also like to use a lot of simulation to test things and to play around with stuff to see what happens when you breach assumption what happens when you don't and so on and so forth at least to me that helps me understand what happens aside from the theory okay so how are we doing so far Okay, still alive. Yes. All right, so it's uh, free. What I propose before we move on to our next test, so now testing normality, because if we make the assumption of normality, uh, we want to check if this assumption is correct. So before we uh, move on to next, I propose that we do our 15 minute break now. And then when we are back from the break, maybe this has had some time to, you know, move a little bit in your hand. Maybe you have to, some time to manipulate the concept or, you know, just, you know, go and take a coffee, iterate yourself. And then we will then move on to the second test. All good? Okay. So then I will uh, pause recording. And so, as usual, do not hesitate to ask questions. So, we want to test normality. Um, as there is no perfect test for that, I'll explain why and what are the tests in a moment. We, oh, in general, want to both use a test, but also maybe a visual uh, assessment can be quite useful. For that, the best um, graphical of a view well, that is the quantile quantile plot or QQ plot in short. So these compare the observed quantile, okay, the quantile of the points in your sample with the one that we would expect under the standard distribution you compare with. So for instance, usually it's uh, normal, but in the end, that could be any sort of other theoretical distribution you have in mind, right? general is normal and that's why this is the default. So to create one of these, we, for instance, I will demonstrate one uh, QQ plot with a sample drawn from a normal distribution. So this is a sample where uh, you actually are respecting the assumption. So you should see something close to the diagonal and then from something other than the normal distribution. And so you will see something different. So then I use stats.propplot, and by default, it compares against a normal distribution. And I give the sample, and you see that then I say to it, like, you should plot in this particular axis because I want to do two subplots there. So this is what happens when you have indeed a normal distribution. You see that you kind of follow the diagonal. There is always a little bit of 
random noise, especially at the extremities. This is quite expected. And this is what happens when it's not normal. Here, this is a bit away from normal. And you can kind of see this pattern of above, then under, then above, right? There is this systematic bias there. It's not just one few point moving around. OK. Here, to me, I think it's important to build a frame of reference for what is OK under a QQ plot and what is not. Because that's a question that we see very often. Like you have 30 points, and then you look at the QQ plot. And I mean, it's very hard to make a judgment based purely on the QQ plot. Uh, if you haven't looked at some of them uh, with, uh, with cases where you could trust what you were looking first. Here, I can trust that this comes from a normal distribution, because that's what I've drawn, all right? And this, I can trust that it's not from a normal distribution because, again, I control it. Without this, you know, if you don't have too much preconception, it's not so easy to know if that comes from normal. And it's only with a bit of experience, a bit of habit, that when you look at this sort of stuff, you say, eh, that's quite OK, or eh, this is fishy. So play around with that. Maybe we can do a few draws. You see here. We are very, very, very close from the expected, okay, except from maybe one small point there, which is a bit unlikely. But you know, when you do a 100 point, it's not unexpected that one is a bit away from the others. And we can, again, draw a few just to build the expectation there. And it's important to see that if we didn't have 100 sample but 10, then you would see more, maybe more variation, OK? Of course as you have only a few points and yeah, it can over quite a bit more around just by chances. And then of course, then it becomes a bit harder to detect also cases where you are away from uh, the assumption of normality. So here, the when you have so little point, uh, yes, here we know in theory that these are not, uh, these are not normal, but if in practice you encountered that in data, it would be very hard to make a judgment with respect to whether that is normal or not. Okay. Making sense so far? Yeah. Okay. So when in doubt and playing with QQ plot, I would say do not hesitate to play around and create a few of these where you control what happens to kind of build your expectation with these, all right? And then with this graphical overview, we oftentimes uh, pair that with a statistical test. Here I will propose the Shapiro-Wilk test, which is one of maybe the best uh, normality tests. There are a few others. So for instance, here we will use Shapiro, but you will see also a lot used normal test, which is a, also known as a D'Agostino's test. And there are a few others as well. The little problem with these tests of normality is, 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 is coming from two points, OK? The first is uh, that they have the uh, null hypothesis as normality here. And in statistical testing, what we would like in general is that the null hypothesis is what we want to reject, OK? You know that in science, we can only advance by rejecting hypotheses, OK? Uh, and we do not want to accept our null hypothesis. That's not really how the system works, because seeing a large p-value does not mean that the, again, null hypothesis is true. It may mean that it's true, but it may also mean that we don't have enough point to detect a difference, OK? So that's one first very important problem with this test of, um, of um, sorry, with this test of normality. The second is um, that uh, they only really oftentimes look at a few properties of the distribution. For instance, they will try to test if it's uh, if it's uh, symmetrical and if it has the right uh, the right peak. So if it's not, uh, so if we come back up there, 
if it's quite like this and it's not under with heavy tail or above with two short tails, okay? But that's just looking at two properties of the normal distribution among many. And a few other tests test other properties, but none of them is all encompassing. So that's another limit there, okay? Well, furthermore, here the Shapiro test is limited to 5,000 points max, which covers most case. In, and if that's not the case, then we have another test, but that's the idea. So that's why here I always couple a visual assessment with the test, okay? I never do only one because sometimes it may happen that the test does not detect a difference from, uh, from normality because it only looks at a few things and he, my eye might detect that. Or conversely, when you are in a weird case like this, when you don't have a lot of points, having also the test telling you that, well, it's not so unlikely to see something like this if that came from a normal distribution can help you decide a bit. Okay. So the Shapiro test, I will not go too much in the detail, but now the idea, if we take now our sample from a normal distribution and sample from an exponential distribution, the null hypothesis is uh, that we have a uh, normality. And here with very small sample of size 10, you can see that the p-value is 0 0.1 and 0 0.13 for both the normal and the exponential data. So I'm remember when in one of these cases where here the p-value is large, that doesn't mean that this comes from a normal distribution because we know that's not the case actually. That just means that we maybe don't have enough point in order to be able to do a informed judgment with, uh, with this. And of course, it's very hard. In practice, you don't know this truth here. So if you have a large p-value, you cannot make a judgment of whether you know, uh, your null hypothesis is true or it's just that you don't have enough point. And that's why we don't say that we accept H0. We always say that we fail to reject H0, all right? That's just a way of suspending our judgment. Uh, so uh, from Rosario, so in this test, we need to get a large p-value to accept. Um, uh, so in this test, we need to get a large p-value to fail to reject the null hypothesis, if I may. But that's the idea, yes. A large p-value means that you are you have a draw which is fairly likely under normality. Right, with that being said now, if my sample size is 10, then to me, it would make sense to say that it's hard to make a judgment. Now, if my sample size is instead uh, 1,000, okay, there I would know that actually when you have 1,000 point, finding a large p-value is actually quite indicative of, a, of uh, uh, some data which is very close to normal, okay? And here you see with something which is not normal, you have very small p-value, okay? 10 to the, here it's practically indistinguishable, uh, indis indistinguishable from zero, okay? 10 to the minus 13, uh, 30, okay? So there we have also to exercise a bit of judgment, right? You, you will not, exp uh, you will not interpret exactly the, the thing in the exact same way depending on the number of points that you have there. Here's an example here again, for instance, here with 100 points and see that we get here p-value of 8% with normal data and 10 to the power minus nine for, for non-normal data, all right? So that should also color a little bit how you approach these. And here you see how suddenly, um, because we are not in this nice frame where we want to reject the null hypothesis, we have we we are much less comfortable with our conclusion, and that's the problem. Okay, so with that being said, in if there is no burning question, there is time for a small micro exercise for you. We have done the test, but we forgot to check the assumption of the test. So now check the normality for the weights of the mice, uh, Cho data and HDFD data, right? So we make sure that you have them, and then maybe do a QQ plot for each and a 
Shapiro test for each, and then say what are your conclusions. All right, so I will let you work. Please put a green tick next to your name if you think that normality is quite okay, and a red cross next to your name if you think that the normality is not okay. All right, once you have done the test. Okay, so most of you have answered. I see a majority of people who think that normality is okay, and two says no. Okay, so let's have a look together. So the first thing I did was to lazily copy and paste from this code there to there, and then just change sample N and sample E with show and HFD, right? I love copy pasting. Uh, it's a uh, a very useful art. And then I will just do that here again, copy and paste. And then I want to change sample E and sample N to HFD and show data. So HFD, data, HFD, HFD, and then show, and we should be fine. Let's look at it. So we get here p value of 13 a uh, 15 percent 16 percent let's say for show data and for hfd 38 percent all right so in both case our p value are not significant 
at the 5% uh, threshold, okay? So that's one thing, okay? So it says, okay, you have 30 points and you are not significantly different with uh, departing significantly from there. So we fade to reject H0. And when you look at this here and there, it seems to be a bit kind of, I would say, close-ish there. It follows fairly well. And there, here there is this point, which is maybe a bit unlikely, but again, all in 30 point or 30 or so point, it's not completely crazy. Um, one thing that I can check also is maybe the length of HFD data and the length of show data. So 29 and 20, okay. So that's for uh, HFD second and then show is that. So Cho has only 21 point here. And if you want to help get convinced that this is okay or not, maybe you could just have you know a look in there, change the side to 21, and then have a little look like here, generate a few here, a sample uh, with size 21 and say, okay, you know, would you kind of by random, if I just show you that, does it seem much more unlikely than whatever you see here, okay? So if I were to then repeat that 10 times and then I would put this plot in the middle of all the 10 others, would it would this one completely stand out or would it kind of look the same? So that's, if you will, that's the idea. That's what you want to, that's the sort of judgment that you want to make. Here, for me, this is, really not so different from the expected. Uh, and here the p-values are both big. So I would make the judgment that if there is a deviation from normality, it is really not so large, right? Furthermore, of course, what you want in that particular case, in the very particular case of the t-test, is not necessarily the normality of the data itself, but the normality of the sample mean and so that has a let's say a layer of certain of security there because even if your data is departing slightly from the normal distribution not too much but slightly the central limit theorem ensures that if you have enough point then your sample mean will converge toward the normal all right here with 20 points and something close to a normal distribution if not normal I'm quite confident that we would be inside the frame of the assumption of the t-test. Okay, is that okay for everyone? Does it make sense? Yes, okay, good. So you will see that while I talk about this, um, I try to depart from the very let's say simple and classical way of interpreting and just looking at p-value saying, okay, p-value is under this, I automatically interpret that. P-value is above that, I automatically interpret this. I want to give you and to convey to you the kind of fact that it's not as simple as that and we have to care a bit about what the p-value actually means uh, in order to have a more, a slightly more nuanced judgment. Uh, there's a question in the chat. How can we check that the sample mean is normally distributed in case we are not convinced of the data set? Uh, it's hard in to do in practice. Uh, the way that you would do that is if you know that you are using a something which is not the standard, uh, you know, your uh, normal distribution. For instance, let's say that you know for some reason that your data is from a uh, an exponential distribution, okay? Because of a reason you have this information. So you know it's not normal, all right? But then you could ask the question, okay, now is the sample mean normally distributed? So in that case where you know what is the kind of theoretical distribution under that, you could do simulations of the sample mean, so actually up, and then you could simulate a sample mean here for data extracted from an exponential 
distribution with a sample of size 100. And then when you, you would see that here, when you have you know, samples of size 100, the mean follows a normal distribution. You would actually compare it to the expected one with this sort of plot there. So there you would say, okay, five is not enough, 50 almost, 500 more than enough. But then of course, that kind of presumes that you know about the theoretical law that is underneath that. And that's that's the kind of hard question. So in most case, you don't know. And so that's in reality very hard. And so if you don't feel confident that you want to make this assumption of normality, and in many cases, it's true that you don't want to make this assumption, uh, then we have to change the sort of test that we do. We have to switch to what we would call non-parametric test. So non-parametric test, non-parametric statistics are tests which don't make an assumption about the family of distribution of what you are computing. They don't presume normality, binomiality, whatever, okay? So they are like, they offer you much more liberty, much more freedom, okay? They are much broader in application. So the non-parametric equivalent of the t-test is what we call the Mann-Whitney Hue test. His assumption are that all observation from our, uh, from sample are independent from one another, so same as before, and that the values are ordinal. That means that they should you sh you could they could be compared. All right, so. The most common case is that they are numbers, and so number you can compare them, but they don't even have to be compare. Uh, they don't even have to be numbers. As soon as there are two things which you can compare, which you can rank, then it's okay. The null hypothesis is that is not exactly the equality of mean of the population. It's something a bit weirder or longer to write, at least is that the probability that a randomly selected value from the first sample is lower than a randomly selected value from the second sample is equal to the probability of being greater, right? So I pick a random element from uh, from the from population one, another random element from population two, and I say, okay, and does null hypothesis, I have a 50-50% chance that uh, the uh, individual from population one is higher than population from uh, element two than the kind of converse, all right? And if we are away from the null hypothesis, that means that there is kind of a skew. I have a higher probability of here being above in population one than in population two, right? Slightly different interpretation. So the test statistic is computed by looking at the observation in the group and counting for each one what is their rank how many uh how many uh times are they above the uh other categories okay and you count 0 0.5 for ties so for instance this first point is above one orange point this second point is above three orange points and above four orange points and then above five orange points so you get one three four five you sum and you get your test statistic 13, okay? So this is the idea. And then this value will be compared against the theoretical low for this test statistic. And that will be used to give us a, um, a p-value. I will not go into the detail of how this, uh, this test statistic, uh, you know, theoretical values are obtained. That's actually quite hard. All right, so, in practice, let's say you have two sample, 1.2, 1.5, 2.3, 3.0, 3.1, and then 1.1, 1.8, 2.2, 2.4, 2.8. Here you see that you have only five observations for each. So uh, presuming normality will be very, very hard. We know that any kind of test would not reject normality because we have so many, 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 uh, so little number of points. And we say that we don't want to presume that we don't want to make that risk. So we prefer to go with the non, uh, with the with the non-parametric option. So if we do that manually, that would say we compute u, we give two sample, and then for each sample, for each value in each sample, we go through each, and if it's uh, if 
do you have two values uh, which are like above one another? So if it's above in sample A with respect to sample B, then the U for sample A is plus one. If they are equal, this is a tie, so it's plus zero one. And if it's uh, above in the second one, then it's plus one for the other one. Okay, so as you can see here, I computed it first like there for the blue, but I could do the same here for the orange and I would get here zero, one, one. Then here I would get two because this point is greater than two blue points and then three. And I would get a U which is different from the other sample, right? So actually for two sample, you get two U values, okay? And in general, you pick the minimum out of these two values. So I compute these, all right, just by comparing all each value compared to one another. And I get my u, which I computed manually. And then I will just do the same thing, but with the man with u function of stats, which just takes sample one, sample two, the method will be exact and the alternative will be two-sided, okay? Here you could say one-sided. So remember, either you have the null hypothesis is that they are equal, alternative is that they could be well, above or under and when it's one-sided you would say okay it's only above so only one way of departing from the null hypothesis all right and so we do that and our here u computed with manual or with scipy is the same there's a small trick with scipy if you want to have the u value you have to compute it with both order of the sample, sample one first and sample one second, because they don't compute both at once. Nevertheless, irrespective of the order, the p-value will be the same and will be valid, okay? So here my p-value in particular is 0 0.69, is quite high. I would fail to reject the null hypothesis that the probability of, you know, of having uh, one random point in uh, sample one being uh, uh, greater than uh, one point in sample two is 50%. Right. Very important note. If for some reason you are using an old version of SciPy, uh, specifically under SciPy uh, 1.7, then step man with, uh, the man with Neu function is uh, not valid when the number of observation is, uh, you know, under 20, okay? It's a case where it's not possible. And so in that case, you have to grab the value of u and then manually go and look in a table. So you have to do that the old fashioned way. And you have to say, okay, what is the number of observation? Maybe the number of observation is 10. And then what is the number of observation is a second point. And then for a p, a p value uh, there, here of 5%, then the limit, the threshold for decision would be 23, okay? Hopefully, you never have to do that, right? That's the very old-fashioned way of uh, checking your p-values. If you want to check your version of SciPy, you go uh, import SciPy and then SciPy.version. And here, there is two underscore, okay? It's quite important. So you can test it on your own. I think it's very likely that you have something above 1.7. Now, in most of the case, this will be the case. But if for some reason you are on an older computer, or maybe on a cluster or something like this, it can be useful to, to check this little detail because that may change uh, quite a bit and that might uh, play a role there. So yeah, just be wary about this. Okay, so that's it. So you can see then this is this non-parametric alternative. A lot of tests uh, have non-parametric alternative, right? And oftentimes they are called rank tests uh, because we are here. I compare the number of cases where I was above uh, points of the other sample, but another way of computing this test statistic is by making sums of tests, uh, sums of ranks of each of the sem uh, points in one sample. So that's why they have rank sum test name. Okay, so now your turn to just 
try and play. Perform the man with nay u test on the mice data set. Okay, so use the same data as before, but now not the t test, but the man with nay instead. And then what is your conclusion? So same as above, if you fail to reject h0, you use a red cross. And if you reject h0, you use a green tick. All right, I'll let you work.
Okay, great. So I see that most of you have results. That's nice. Uh, so let's look at it together. So it's actually not too, too hard, as you can see. Draw data, HFD data, and then feed that to SciPy.StatsMan with you. And then I want to say method equal up exact because I see no reason why I should not use the exact method, especially when it, I don't have too much points. Uh, when I have a lot of points, then computing the 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 p value with the exact method I think can be a bit long, and then the asymptotic uh, approximation with a normal distribution is preferred. And when you have a lot of points, then it, the assumption actually works well. The the approximation actually works well. But here in this sort of case, I see no reason not to use the exact one. So test statistics 35.0 as many of you have found. And my p-value is two to the power, uh, uh, two times 10 to the power minus zero nine. So it's also very small. So here also the, um, the, 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 the manuit when you also reject the null hypothesis and say that there is a, let's say difference in location between these two tests, okay? Here, you could then say to me, well, I mean, okay, you made us use the t-test. It shows that they are different, but then you, sh but then the t-test has all this assumption of normality and so on and so forth. And that is hard to test and well, yeah, but then you showed us the non-parametric and the non-parametric also rejects, right? So why not always use the Matmitne u-test? Okay, what do you think about that? Why? would we not always use the Matt Whitney U test after all? Because it here it worked as well. Yes. As far as I know, they have less power or they need to be more different from each other before they get significant. So if you have slight differences, then you may miss it. Exactly. Thank you. That's the perfect answer. So indeed, we can say that they have what we call less statistical power, but translated into layman term, if you want, that means that they need to have either more data or larger differences uh, before they can actually have smaller p-value. Whereas the t-test have more power, that means that it is better able to detect small difference between these. If you will, the idea is that the t-test has more information. It has the information that comes from its assumption and it, so it, it is able to leverage this additional information to be more precise, all right? Whereas the man with Neu has no information, makes no assumption. So then it's slightly less precise in its judgment. All right, so that actually lets us tie into a bit more of a discussion about p-values, statistical powers, and types of error that we can make. So the first thing is type of error. So I like this little doodle, uh, yeah, meme maybe we could say, two differences between the two type of error. There is what we call type one and type two. So type one error is the error that we make when we reject H0 while it's true, okay? So if we are in a pregnancy test, X0 is that you are not pregnant and H1 is that you are pregnant, okay? And then a type one error is to say to someone who is not pregnant that they are. And contrastingly, Type two error is accepting H0, failing to reject H0 while it is false. So then we have a person who is pregnant and we say to them that they are not pregnant. So far, so good. So then we can always build this sort of little table, which I'm sure that you've already seen a lot of time, but it's always good to then re you know, re-inject that sort of thing. You have your reality where H0 is false or true and the test which either rejects or accepts H0 or fail to reject H0. 
And so if the reality is that it's false and then that it you reject, then you reject it correctly. If it was true and you fail to accept it, then you accept correctly. And then you have your different type of error when H0 is true and you fail to reject them or H0 is false and fail to accept them. The probability of doing type one error is typically what we call alpha. And this is the threshold that we use to say that a p-value is significant or not, okay? So that's the type of error that you control because you are the one who chooses the threshold. Might be 5%, might be 1%, might be 1 per 1,000, might be 10%, okay? This is something that you choose and you control when you make when you when you choose that, you decide what sort of a what sort of a bet you want to take on the type one error. Okay. But then that's not the only way that you could be wrong. You could be wrong with the type two error as well. And so there's this other probability of being wrong that you have much less control on. And so this error is beta. And typically when we speak about it, we don't use beta directly, we talk about the power of the test, which is just one minus beta. So the power of the test is for a given setup where H0 is false in reality, what is the probability that our test would be able to correctly reject H0? All right, so far so good. A little bit of a definition there. Then we have our p-values. So a p-value is a lot of thing, but there is also a lot of thing that it's not. And I would say everyone gets some of these wrong. And when I say everyone is like, it's been shown that even a university professor who teach about statistics can regularly get the interpretation of p-value wrong because it's kind of easy to trick oneself into thinking that we know what they are and so on and so forth, but they oftentimes mean a bit less than what we think. Of course, when we are asked about them directly and we think about it and we take the time to think about it, we can get it right. But in practice, when we read papers, when we analyze our data, our data it's a bit easy to forget about it and to misinterpret and overinterpret them. So the p-value is the probability of obtaining a test statistic as or more extreme than the observed one, if the null hypothesis is true. So you always depend on the null hypothesis, okay? Remember our example earlier with the binomial law and probability of getting a certain number of head or tails. So as I said, you are always linked to a specific null hypothesis. The way that we compute the p-value is not the same if we presume that the coin is fair, that the uh, probability of getting heads is 0 0.5, or if we presume that maybe it's 0 0.55 or 0 0.6 and so on and so forth. In each of these, then the p-value would be computed completely differently. So it's then very important to say that the p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is correct, it's not the probability that it's incorrect. It's not the probability that we are making an error. It's maybe closer, although not exactly, the probability that we are making a type one error. But then there is also the probability of uh, of the of beta, which is that we make an error of the other kind. All right, a large p-value does not nearly prove that your H0 is uh, is true, okay? Might just mean that you don't have enough data, that you don't have enough signal in your data to be able to reliably detect the difference. And one last part, always report the exact p-value in your papers, please, please, please. Because just saying p under 0 0.05 is not, is not enough. Like nowadays, there's no reason that you just don't give the actual values because your threshold for significant might be 0 0.05, but for other people, it will be maybe 0 0.01 and so on and so forth. So to let people have a fair judgment 
on your you know on your results and so on and so forth to report the real values so um a little uh, thing in the presence of a true effect so that's maybe to rebound on that in the presence of a true effect the p values will be affected by the sample size so the larger the sample size the smaller the p value but um when you don't have a real effect then the p value should not be affected by the sample size you can have larger and larger and larger sample size the p value should stay about the same all right for example if i draw samples from without any difference compute p values and then try with a uh, uh, more and more and more and more data i have two situation either there is no real difference between the two sample and then you see i can have three 10 or 100 individual in the samples the p value are spread in exactly the same way but if there is an actual difference between the two then it makes a difference whether or not i have three 10 or 100 samples okay and there you can see that when there is only three points in most case i fail to detect the difference in when there is 10 points in most case i am able to detect the difference and when there is 100 points here yeah, i am able to detect the difference in almost all of the cases all right that makes sense as well Uh, yes, Rosario. Yeah, uh, just uh, just about this threshold setting. It is always something that uh, I have trouble understanding. Like mm -hmm. what, what we use is this zero point zero five generally. Yeah. In uh, biology or biochemistry, but mm -hmm. uh, you say that everybody can choose a different one. Yes. How would how do we you know like evaluate ourselves? Okay, so it to me it all relates to how much certainty do you want to have in your result. Okay, if you ask, if you reject a null hypothesis with a p-value of zero point zero five, you kind of make the bet, uh, and you know that then you have a five percent chance of being wrong on your bet. Your bet is that you reject H zero. And the probability that uh, that you made a mistake is five percent, if you will. So then that depends. Like, are you a betting man or not? How much do you want to bet on that? And it depends on. And I think, like, to me, the person who created uh, the t test was uh, a brewer for Guinness, and he kind of put it that way. Um, how much do you stand to gain or do you stand to lose depending on whether you are wrong or not okay and then this compare you should kind of weigh that with the probability that you are making a mistake by doing that particular bet and you know make your decision based on that you can use actual betting strategy in the end so if you are like okay my p-value is maybe 0 0.045 you could say okay I mean, maybe then it's worth it to make some uh, some validation experiment on it, uh, but maybe I won't spend one million franc or one billion franc just to just to validate that. But maybe spending a few weeks to test it would be worth it. Okay. Thank you. It's just as several times we uh, tell stories like, okay, the p-value is low enough to uh, observe a significant difference between these two data sets. Mm -hmm. And this is just based purely on these p-value numbers, like lower than 0 0.05, yes, it is significant. If you get like 0 0.06, you say, no, no, it's not significant. Yeah. So you test it again. So this is a misconception, I guess. Yeah. Because yeah, it is it is something that we have to be careful about. Uh, again, if we come back to the early days of p-values when we had a bit less maybe drag and inertia to our practice. Sometimes people would see a p-value of, I don't know, 8% and then would say, right, yes, that's a signal that maybe there is something to look for. Yeah, okay, you don't accept it as the truth, but 
that's a signal that, okay, maybe, you know, I only had 10 sample in each group and got a p-value of 5%. Maybe I will spend a bit more time to go from 10 to 20 sample, see where that gets me. Uh, and same thing, like always validate and so on. Thank you. You're welcome. A very good question. Thank you. Okay, so that is then where we get to power. So as you can see here, as we have a growing number of um, of, uh, of of elements in our group, so as n gets larger, for the same difference, a larger proportion of the tests are detected as significantly different. So that is this proportion of tests which are detected as significantly different with reason. So presuming here that the null hypothesis is false and that we have a specific alternative hypothesis in mind, we can call that the power of the test, okay? The power of the test is something that depends not only on a specific null hypothesis, but also on a specific alternative hypothesis, okay? So the alternative hypothesis cannot be uh, the two samples are different. No, you have to define a precise difference between the two and a specific experimental setup with sample size and variance. And when you have this fixed, then it's possible to compute the power of a test. And that means that you can also then compute the power for each n, and you could then find the n such that you have a little bit of control on your beta, on your risk of, you know, there is a real difference, but I don't have enough samples, so just by chance, I don't see that. And that you can sort of try and control that. And that gives you a minimal sample size, if you will. So let's imagine something. Let's say we have two groups and we presume that the actual mean difference is two. Okay, maybe some previous experiment has let us know that it's maybe likely that uh, the difference is two, all right? And we expect also that the standard deviation should be three. And say, okay, let's imagine I have a sample size of 20 for each group and my significance level threshold. So the alpha level, the belt I want to make is of 5%. I will then make a ton of simulation uh, to see what happened. So what I do is that I simulate then groups. Uh, yeah, I simulate then groups of this size with this difference and this standard deviation. Okay, and I see what happens. Do I actually see a significant p-value or not? And in the end, this is what you see. All right, so. Here in red, this is the expected distribution of uh, the test statistic under the null hypothesis, okay? Here, colored like this in salmon and teal, we have the observed p-value, uh, sorry, the observed test statistic, okay? Under then the, with the real data, so under the actual alternative hypothesis. You have here the threshold at 2.1, about, okay, for your test statistic under the null. And we see that here we have then about half of them which were then correctly rejected, and then half of them which by chance here fall in this red region there, and so they are spuriously accepted in the sense that here we fail to reject H0. Uh, but we are making then a, a mistake because in this particular case, H0 was wrong, all right? And so this fraction there of things that were actually rejected, but with good reason is 54%. And that's the power of the test in this particular setup. All right, so far so good. Can I add a question? Go ahead. So um, <clears throat> we could have p value that less than 0.05, but we still can reject it. We still can um, 
like uh, fail to accept it, right? Or fail to reject it. Uh, so it depends on your threshold for significance level. So for instance, if your threshold for significance is 1%, then yes, a p-value of 0 0.03 would not be declared as significant. And based on what I, I put this threshold? Um, so this threshold is based, as I was saying earlier, this threshold here can be seen as your probability of making a mistake when you reject the H0, okay? So then it kind of depends on how much, basically how much do you want to bet on your decision and how risky of a bet do you want to take? And um, how, okay, okay, so with this, the threshold could also be wrong, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, that how you set this threshold is uh is kind of is very hard because ideally you want the threshold as small as possible because you want to have a low probability of making type one mistake mm -hmm. but then the lower the threshold uh the lower the power so here see with a five percent significance level mm -hmm. so threshold at five percent then i have a 54 percent power but if I lower my threshold to one person because I don't want to make take too much risk, then my power drops to twenty eight percent only. Okay, so in most cases, I'm unable to detect a significant difference in this particular setup. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's kind of a balancing act to find. We always have to accept some risk. Uh, as we are doing our bet. And it's our kind of job to have a critical look uh, on that and on, you know, saying that, okay, I'm making this decision. I'm making this decision with this sort of risk of threshold. So what I will, how I will interpret my result, what I will do based on this p-value should always be taken with a grain of salt and the grain of salt should be as big as your significance threshold, if you will. Does that make a bit more sense? Somehow, because for example, if I have two groups of, of patients, one are um, like um, treated, one one not. So based on what I say, uh, these are these are these two groups has good p value or not be a, or not a good p value. So so uh, yeah. So here that will be based on what is the p-value that you do when you compare them is the p-value is something like 10 to the power minus six. Mm -hmm. In most cases, like this is super tiny. And so you know that if you declare them as significantly different, you are not taking too much of a risk. Mm -hmm. But if the p-value is, I don't know, 0 0.02, so 2% or if the p-value is 0 0.06, you are in this kind of gray area where you are now making more of a risky bet. And so okay. you may declare significance, but you have to be very nuanced about how you will interpret your result after. You have to always take into account the fact that you may have made a mistake when you call that significance, is what I mean. Okay, okay. And then it depends on the risk. So I can risk goes, um, based on the threshold and then I can see if I can interpret my results or not, right? Yes. And then you can also you can also conduct a power analysis to say, okay, in that setup, given the uh given the difference that you I've just observed, so that for instance you observe the difference of two and send that division of twenty of of three, you can say, okay, how likely was it that I would have detected uh, this difference? And that can also help you interpret a little bit uh, also what, you know, what in what sort of situation you are in. That helps you understand a little bit the sort of bet that you are currently making. Okay, thanks. Yes, there is another question by Rosario. Yeah, sorry for... Go ahead. Oh, I've, I think oh. that, yeah, I think the Rosario has, uh, is frozen. Or maybe it's me that is for uh, uh, Just I was wondering about this uh, thing that you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear? Yeah. 
I'm sorry. I just was wondering uh, about the other method you mentioned before that the p-value should change with the amount of data that we analyze. Mm, when when there is a significant difference. Yeah. So basically, if we have a big data set to understand if the p-value makes some sense uh, and we can bet on it, we can just subset the data set and test it and see that the p-value gets lower with a higher amount of data. This is a way to evaluate also our data set. Mm, that could be uh, that could be a way, but with that being said, it's better to just take the p-value with the full data set because if you have a big data set and there is an actual interesting difference, then the p-value should be small anyway. Yeah, 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 I mean, just for our own evaluation, if we have to do different trials, because if we see that the p-value stays constant wherever amount of data we extract from our data set we can understand that the test doesn't make much sense maybe if i in, understood this point there in in a sense yes uh use that with, with caution because it could be also be construed as p hacking by some people but if you want to then use that to gain a better understanding of how uh, tests work and you know how much of uh, how many sample could you would or could need to detect the significance and test the power, then that might be okay. Thank you, yes. All right, so do we have more question on this now new concept of the power, p-values and so on and so forth? Not so far, okay, so then, Let's see how we can use this concept of the power to actually inform our protocol. So first off, here I used simulation, but for simple tests such as the t-test, which are very well known, you can find in some libraries some function to directly compute the power. So here from the stat models library, I import so t-test independence power. And the way this little uh, function or object work is that you declare one and then you give it an effect size. So the effect size is the mean difference divided by the standard deviation, okay? So you give it an effect size, number of observation in the sample one. So ratio between the number of observation in sample one and sample two, okay? So for instance, here they have the same size. So it's a ratio of one. And then alpha, the significance threshold for the test. So it's a set of same sort of setup than what I had here before, a main difference and standard deviation, sample size, significance level. All right. And so here, then this will automatically compute me the power. So this should be about the same number here. So here, for instance, that's with an alpha equal 0 0.01. So if I switch that to 1%, then you see here I get 28.8% and that's quite close to this empirically obtained with simulation 28.5%, okay? So you don't have to do all the simulations, you have the function directly for that. Uh, these exist for most well-known tests like the chi-square, Fisher test, t-test, ANOVA and so on and so forth. If you are using something which is not among these, then I would recommend doing some simulation like what I've shown just above, so that you can always compute your power. All right, so that's one thing. Okay, you can compute your power for a given setup, but now you can also play. You can say, okay, I have an effect size of one. Maybe I've just done like a small study. And this small study was done with just 10 individual, okay? And has shown me an effect size of one. And the p-value maybe was like, quite, you know, maybe 0 0.03, 3%. So I'm like, okay, that's not very big. Uh, I maybe want to collect a bit more data uh, to confirm this hypothesis. So I say, okay, my effect size is one. I would like to have a significance threshold of 0 0.01, okay, so that I have, you know, better certainty about my result. What would be the minimal sample size that I should collect in order to have a, let's say, 80% chance of detecting my difference, okay? So that I have a statistical power of 
And so then I could, for instance, for each sample size between two and 50, compute the power for this sample size there. So it's the same thing as before. It's just that now I've put the sample size in a loop. Or there's another way is that there is also a solve power function where you give everything, the same thing as before. It's just that one of these things, you stay, you, you put it at none. And so it the function will understand that this is what you would like to find. So that will give you, return you the smallest value for these other parameters. So let's try it out. And that you see, we have here for the FX size of one, the power that grows with the sample size and crosses the threshold of 0 0.8 at about 25, right? And that's what we see here. The minimum sample size is 25.6. So say here, 26 individual in each sample, all right? That's also how you would go at it. You make a small study first to see if it's kind of worth it to do a slightly bigger study. That also gives you an, exp uh, an, ex uh, an estimate of your effect size. And then you use a power calculator to then say, okay, now I want to do a bigger study. What should be the minimal sample size to have a good power to be able to find again that effect, but now with good confidence. Okay. Does this make sense? This whole kind of process? Yeah. Okay. So I hope that now you can hold start viewing your p-values with kind of more nuance and start interpreting them for what they actually mean and not just being like under 0 0.05 significance above equal non-significance and call it today. Okay, so we arrive at the end of today. I know that there was a lot of concept that it was very intense. Uh, I ask out of you a, let's say, last effort is to go on a small exercise. So here, consider the mice data set that we loaded before. Compute the effect size for the diet on the weight, and then compute the statistical power of the corresponding t-test for that effect size. All right, so you have here just what you need to, uh, you know, have a little look at the data again and to have these vectors in case you don't have them anymore. And for the rest, it's your turn to play. All right, so then I will stop the recording and stop sharing and let you work. That. Okay, so let's go to that. So we have our data. Okay, first thing first, we will gather n1 and n2 as the length of both thing. All right, and then the mean of both thing. All right, so this is very, let's say, simple. And uh, we have now a mean of 28 and a mean of 27. So by making the difference between that, we can have already the mean difference. Now, the next step is to divide this by the standard deviation. That's more easily said than done, because if we now do the same thing, we don't have one standard deviation, but we have two. We have one for the CHO data and one for the HFD data. And as you can see, they are far from equal. At least it doesn't look like they are. 2.5 here and 4.9 there. So now we have to kind of ask ourselves, what do we do with that? Which one do we pick? How do we solve that? So who had looked at the standard deviations? It's a bit tricky, so there's absolutely no <laughs> no shame if you did not think about it. It's also the end of the day. Everyone is tired, so it's normal. Is it like the, uh, I did the difference and then I did the square root of the difference or was, was that wrong? So this kind of this idea, so maybe we could do like an average between the two. Maybe we could also say, if you remember, that there is this DDOF1, so that when you estimate a variance from a from a sample, you have to have a little minus one on the n in order to have a fair estimate there, but still you have this difference. So there we have to actually come back to what we have seen earlier on uh, with the 
Welsh T test, uh, where there was this weird way of computing the variance, which we call computing a pooled variance, right? So for that, we actually compute both variance with this delta degree of freedom, and then we pull them together with this uh, with this formula there, where we multiply them by n uh, minus one, and then divided by the sum of the n's, and then uh, compute the square root of that, okay? So it's admittedly not easy, and I would not fault that to not have thought about it. It's, let's say, a little bit of a trick here. Sorry about pulling that one on you so late. So there's a question by Sabine. Yeah, so I have very quickly just checked the Google how to compute this variance, and there they state you you just need to divide by one, of, so by the standard deviation of one of the two groups. So why are we now here doing this pooled variance? I think I, I I don't know what exactly you read. I think this may be because you are in the case where they presume equality of variance between the two group. Uh, okay. If you presume equality of violence between the two groups, then indeed, okay. in that case. But here, unfortunately, I don't think that's the case. And then there is a question by uh, Katerina. So this DDOF there is the delta degree of freedom. So if I am sorry, I'm going to uh, scroll a lot. Then if I come back to the t-test, then remember then where we have here we take we compute the square difference with the means that's how we compute a variance and rather than normally what we do normally is just to divide it by n and then here we divide it by n minus one so this reflects the if you will the extra uncertainty uh, that you have when uh, when you estimate the variance of a uh, of a sample, right? Because this is an estimate there. So you have another layer, okay? And that's why the, then this, you should have a slight overinflation there because otherwise you will consistently underestimate the variance, right? That's a very theoretical result there as to how we can correct this effect. And it's just this little minus one there. Does this make more sense? Okay, perfect. So up, up. So with that, once we actually take that into account, we get our FX size here of minus 2.01. Maybe you got something positive if you did HFD minus chow, but if you do chow minus HFD, you got minus something. The test, will be uh, symmetrical, will be two-sided, so it doesn't matter. Right, and so I get this. So that's why I ask also what effect size you had found, because depending on how you had decide to handle the, uh, the standard deviation problem, then you might end up with different effect size, right? And then I give that to p dot power, and for this effect size and uh, this, observation in n1 the ratio is n2 divided by n1 and i say here for a one percent fresh alpha threshold i've got a power of 0 0.99998 and so, so quite high in fact if you put it to 0 0.05 you will get 1.0 so it's numerically not distinguished from one so it might be maybe one minus 10 to the power 6, or maybe 1 minus 10 to the power 10, something close to that, OK? But nevertheless, here we have something very, uh, very high. All right. So I, there is here this little trick uh, there. It's not something to remember just by heart, I would say. Just remember that sometimes there are some weird stuff. And so it pays to spend a bit of time on Wikipedia and Google and so on and so forth to see how we can handle this. All right. OK. So it's uh, 4.50. If there is no burning questions, I see no one who is raised hand for the moment. I will use this. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Can I just 
um, explain uh, the, the, um, the one from line 12 to down, like from yes to, to, the, to the next cell. Sorry, so this and then that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So here we compute the FX size. The FX size is the difference in mean divided by the standard deviation. Yeah. Here's a standard deviation. We get it with the square root of the pooled variance. So far, so good? Yeah. OK. Uh, so then once we have this effect site, we can plug it into the t-test of independence power calculator from stats models. And so we give the effect size, the number of observation in the group one, the ratio between the number of observation in the group two and the group one, so n2 divided by n1, and then our alpha threshold for the p-value. And the group one is the just the show data, right? Or was it that? what was the group one? Sorry, uh, n1 is the show data, yeah. Then, okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, this number of observation. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. So let's use our last bit of energy there to add a little bit of something, right? I will go quite fast with that, but I think this is a very important concept. I'm sure that you've heard about it. It's multiple testing. So as with most uh, statistical concept, there is an XKCD strip that goes with it. If you don't know about it, it's a very nice web comic about science. So the idea is that you have someone making some claim and the scientists have to test for it. And then when they test if chili bean cause acne and they test for you know, old chili beans, they find that the p-value is not significant. It's above 0 0.05. But then people say, oh, I think it's only one of the 20 colors that does it. So then scientists go and investigate. And so they test all 20 colors of jelly bean. And for all 20 colors, the p-value is 0 0.05, except for the green jelly bean, where the p-value is under 0 0.05. And thus, in the new, you will see that green jelly are linked to acne, that they cause acne. But uh, we forget, and here it's written, but we forget that this is with a p-value under 0 0.5, though so you have a 95 confidence. And all of these other tests on all of the other color are conveniently forgotten. But now, I guess that by now you understand that once you have done 20 tests, each test had a 5% chance of, being, of having a p-value below 5%, just by chance if it was actually not uh, not uh, if H0 is true. So even in the absence of an effect, sometimes just by chance, you will get a low p-value. And if you do the test, if you repeat the test many times, if you do many tests, then the probability that at least one test becomes significant just by chance gets high. So for instance, if I do one test, then the probability is only 5%. But if I do already 20 tests, then the probability that at least one test is significant just by chance in absence of an effect, then this is 50%. And then if you do more tests, this grows and grows and grows and gets very close to one, up to the point that if you imagine that you are, for instance, testing a panel of 600 proteins for significant difference between two groups, if you have a 5%, uh, you know, threshold there, you know that among your 600 protein, then even if there is absolutely no difference, you will find about 600 times 5%. So that would be 30 protein that show up with P values lower than 5% just by chance, all right? So then it can become hard to differentiate between the one which are there just by chance and the one which are actually significant. So far, so good. Yes. OK. And so then, what well, we have to try and account for that. And the way that we account for it traditionally is by applying a correction procedure to our p-values. I will talk about 
two procedures. I will not talk about it, them in the detail for now. The first is controlling what we call the family-wise error rate, probability of obtaining any false positive. So significant p-value, but they are actually are not. And the other is to try and control the proportion of false positive among all of your findings. So I found, let's say, 50 proteins who are actually, you know, that I see as significant. And I want to control that there is no more than 5% of these 50, which are false positive. So that's a false discovery rate. And so we have several different procedures for that. But here you have for controlling the FWE as a Bonferroni method, very well known. Say you are doing N tests. So then your threshold becomes the original threshold divided by N. Okay. The original threshold was 0 0.05. You are doing 10 tests, so your new threshold becomes 0 0.005. Very simple, but also very conservative. That means that you lose a lot of statistical power. But also, you are quite sure that you are not making too much mistake. Uh, so, you know, a balancing act always. And then the Benjamin Hodgeberg controls the false discovery rate. It's a bit more complex. The idea is that you will sort of your all of your p values and then you will compare alpha times the number of tests to uh, the actual number of discoveries that you would make at any given threshold and when you have a ratio between alpha n and this threshold that gives you where you do the cut i will not go into the detail there just he understand that this is a slightly a different method, and that tries to optimize something slightly different than the FWR, okay? So if we test this briefly in the last method that I have, um, if I imagine a little setup where I do 10,000 tests, where there is absolutely no difference, okay? It's sample size of 100 and standard deviation of one, okay? It doesn't matter too much there. I do the test and then from statmodel.multitest here, I import the multiple test function. I give to it the list of all the p-values that I have, the alpha threshold for significance, and whether I want to apply the Bonferroni method or the FDR, Benjamini Hodgeberg method, and returns to me four elements, the number of uh, tests that were rejected, the FWERs, and the uh, alpha under the CDAC method, that's not what we are using, and the corrected alpha under the Bonferroni method, that's what we are interested in. And then for the other, it's the same thing, it's just that the second element is not FWER, but FDRs, okay? And so once we have that, we can kind of compare them. And here we see that this is our p-values there. 5% of them are previously significant. And you see here the corrected p-values, which are all kind of put toward uh, one, so they were corrected, okay? And so no tests were spuriously uh, rejected using either FWER or FDR, okay? And in a slightly different scenario when 100 out of the 10,000 tests were actually different, uh, we have a slightly different case there when our p-value uh, let me check that I have the right thing. No, I don't because I did not do the simulation. Yeah. So we have this scenario when now out of the 10,000 tests, there is 100 that should be seen as significant. And the p-value sees 583 significant. FDR only 65. FDR 109. Okay. So FDWER is more conservative. Number of course, correctly significant test out of 100 is 100 for the p-value. So p-value detects all significant difference, but it also has a lot of spuriously significant tests, four, five, 483. So that means that if you have like here, this almost 600 significant tests, you know that only one sixth of that is actually significant. Most of them are significant just by chance spuriously. But the, for the FWR, you only detect 65% correctly, but you have made absolutely no mistake. So you are more conservative. You detect less thing, but you make less mistakes or less mistake of type 
uh, the, uh, less mistake of type one. And then the last is that with the FDR, you detect 99% of this actually significant uh, different test, but then you also have 10. So 10% 10 of them are actually mistakenly seen, spuriously seen as, uh, as significant. All right, so that's a little bit how this works. So yesterday, we spent first some time um, just uh, learning how to play around with pandas and with Matplotlib and Seaborn in order to load and manipulate and represent some data. I will not come back too much to that, but I think this is part of the sort of core uh, skills that we need in order to then be able to properly conduct data analysis, okay? Because you can be quite skilled at pure statistics if you don't know how to look at your data, if you don't know how to read and then single out your data, filter your data, you will not get very far, all right? And once we had that fairly well in place, we started uh, to play around with statistics concepts. So we started discussing uh, a few, let's say, maybe more theoretical aspects of it, in particular distribution, okay? And uh, we then tried to build up, you know, what was a probability density function. So that's here a function that describes the probability of each event across a sets of value for a for a sets of uh, for a set of possible uh, results, okay? And this is then a a tool that lets us describe a certain uh, flavor of randomness, if you want, okay? The pattern of the randomness of a given random variable. We played a little bit with that. We have seen that uh, a same, let's say, family of distribution, for instance, the normal distribution had itself its own flavor depending on different parameters. Here for the normal distribution is just the mean and the variance or mean and standard deviation, okay, which can also be called the localization and the scale. And, uh, and so then we kind of saw why we should always care a bit about the normal distribution, why it was so pervasive. And that is because of one neat little, um, let's say, uh, property, which is called the central limit theorem. So let me go back to this, I think is, um, is the most convincing part. So the idea is that even though the data that you sample may not follow a normal distribution, the central limit theorem states that uh, the mean of uh, of your sample will be distributed according to something very close to a normal distribution if the sample size is large enough and sample size is large enough is this sort of let's say fuzzy definition okay uh, because it how large is large enough depends a little bit on the underlying distribution but you know that as the sample size growth, you should get closer to this normal distribution. And so I tried to demonstrate that using simulation. So I have drawn thousands of samples uh, from a exponential distribution, so something which is quite different from a normal distribution. So you sample some data and you compute the average of this data. And then we do that a lot of time to look at what, you know, how this mean of a sample is uh, distributed. And we tried that for samples of size five, of size 50 and size 500. And I then compared that with what the central limit theorem gives me as to what I should expect, you know, uh, if, the, if, uh, if this sample size is large enough um, property is, is true, what does the central limit theorem tells me this, uh, this sample mean should be. And so this is what we see here. When the sample size is five, then we see that we are, okay, not super far, but we are not at the point yet where we have the sample mean distributed according to the uh, theoretical normal law here. 
But when the sample size grows, for instance, when it's 50 or even better when it's 500, then you can see that we are nearly indistinguishable from the uh, thing that the theoretical normal law predicts for us. Okay, so this is a fairly important uh, property. In particular, here we can see that the mean of a sample will follow a normal distribution whose mean is the mean of the population. So that's nice. That we that means that we can expect that our sample won't fall too far away from the let's say the truth, the mean of the population. All right, and its standard deviation will depend on the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the number of of uh, individual in our sample. All right, so as we gather more individual in our study will have a more precise, uh, better estimate of the uh, of the population mean. So this is all good and well, but then we can ask ourselves, why would we care? Why is that actually important? And it is important because this property means that when you sample you know, a limited number of elements, in, in nature for your for your experience, you don't have the luxury of repeating all of these, okay? You cannot do 10,000 experiments of a sample of size 50. It's not feasibly possible in most of the time in research. But if you know, or if you, if you think that you are in this condition where the central limit theorem appear, then you don't have to just the fact that you have done one sample uh, gives you some expectation as to what are the property of this sample and how the property of the mean of this sample will relate to the property of the whole population. Okay, so that lets you have a frame to do inference from the property of a sample onto the property of the population. And you can do that in a pragmatic way where you are able to give some uh, probability or uh, of uh, that you know your sample mean is within such and such distance of the uh, of the population mean and that's what we basically call the 95 or that's typically what we recapitulate using a 95 probability uh, confidence interval okay so this is what uh, we have seen also yesterday once you are once you have these properties uh, and that you are then able to use the central limit theorem to make this prediction on uh, on on the sample uh, of your uh, of sorry on the mean of your samples then uh, you are able to predict a lot of stuff. So the 95% uh, person confidence interval in particular will let you uh, create this interval around your sample mean. So that's what we see in here. And you know that there is a 95% uh, chance that, uh, that the mean, uh, that the population mean will fall within uh, the 95 percent confidence interval of a sample mean okay that's kind of by definition that's the property of uh, this confidence interval so that means that then you can define this framework uh, where you can rationally estimate the probability that you make certain type of mistake okay so that's when then we were able to use these properties to introduce the statistical hypothesis testing framework where we define a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis, both being statement about the real world. And then from there, we define a test statistic. So that's basically a metric, for example, the mean of a sample and the null hypothesis coupled with a uh, statistical properties such as the central limit theorem will let us predict what is the expected behavior of our test statistic under the null hypothesis. 
Once we have that, we know what we expect under the hypothesis. We can gather our data and compare if our data looks plausible according to the null hypothesis or if it deviates from our expectation. And if it deviates enough from our expectation, then we can say that it was fairly unlikely that uh, such data was obtained under the null hypothesis. And by, if you will, reversing that reasoning, we can say that then the null hypothesis is relatively unlikely. And so we will tend to reject the null hypothesis. All right. And the p value, which is the probability of, of observing a test statistic at least as extreme as the one that we just observed with our empirical data, according to the null hypothesis, is a probability that we can use to gauge how much of a bet we are making when rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay, this is related to the probability that the null hypothesis would be true if we reject it. All right, so far so good. Okay, all right, so then from there, we have seen a number of examples. I will, I think, focus mostly on the t-test, okay, because I think this is, uh, you know, arguably one of the most well-known, uh, most well-known tests uh, out there. And so it's worth it to spend a little bit more time on that. So the t-test is a test where you have two samples coming from, for instance, different population or different groups. Okay, and you want to ask the question, are there, are, are the mean of the population that they are issued from different? Okay, and so you have your two samples and you don't know also the variance of each sample. Also, you want to allow the different variance of both samples to be different. So then what happens is that we know from the literature that uh, that the difference between these two uh, samples should follow some kind of distribution, which is called the T distribution, and which sort of looks like a normal distribution, except that it has what we call heavier tails. So that means that you see here, these are the tail and they are a bit uh, higher there. They have a bit higher density. So that the tail are heavier. That means that let's say improbable events are a bit more likely. And this reflects the extra layer of uncertainty uh, that is added when we don't know the variance of the sample with respect to the converse case where we would know them. So from there, we can build our, uh, our test system. So uh, we have our null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the mean of the two populations, mu1 and mu2, are the same. The alternative is that they are different. Here, see, my alternative hypothesis is just that they are different. That means that I am in a two-sided hypothesis test. We always have the opportunity of, for instance, here saying that H1 would be that mu1 is above mu2. And in that case, the test would be one-sided. Okay, we would only look at one form of deviation. Anyhow, um, so you have to consider then a number of assumptions. So this test presumes that the mean of the sample are normally distributed. Oops, sorry. And that the that uh, the sample are independent from one another, and so if that if these assumptions are true, and only if these assumptions are true, then we know that the difference of the mean of the two samples will follow a t distribution. If the assumptions are not true, then they will not follow a t distribution. Okay, and this is important because 
the fact that they follow a t distribution is what we use to compute the p value okay the p value will just be computed so we have this the p value will just be computed by computing here the uh, the amount if you will of density which lies you know after a given threshold on this uh, on this density function so if this density function is not true because the assumption are not respected then the p value is meaningless so our test statistic in that case and you will see that this is often uh, the case when we do some sort of testing is what we are interested by so here's a difference between the mean of the two sample and it's almost always then normalized by something that make it comparable to a to a to a let's say um scaled version of the distribution of interest okay so this is the distribution of interest the t distribution with a standard deviation of one but of course as you know the standard deviation can can vary that's one of the parameter of this distribution and so to bring us back into this sort of simple case where the standard distribution is one we scale our test statistic by something that depends on the variance of the sample and the size of the um and the size of uh, of the sample okay it's a little bit like when the central limit theorem was saying to us that the standard deviation of uh, the mean of the sample was the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the size of the sample okay. so that's the main idea and here for the t, uh, test it's a bit more complex because you have two samples which might have a different size and which might have different standard deviation so you, ha you have to kind of account for that and that makes the formulas more complex but the idea behind them is only that it's only having a normalization by something depending on standard deviation divided by sample size so here we have our two terms there which are basically our standard deviation but with a normalization with an n minus one term and that due to the fact that uh, if we didn't do this n minus one we would tend to underestimate uh, the variance and again we have to then correct and to account for this small layer of uncertainty due to the fact that we are estimating both the mean and the variance at the same time and this is done by using this little n minus one correction here instead of n and last but not least the t-test has another parameter which is the degree of freedom and which governs how heavy these little tails here are okay if the degree of freedom are is small then these tails are heavier okay there is more spread more uncertainty and if the degree of freedom is large then the tail are smaller and we get closer and closer and closer to a normal distribution and so this degree of freedom the formula is a bit uh, a bit complex here as you can see but if you spend again a little bit of time on that you will see that it depends uh, again on this variance and this um, and this size of the uh, samples there and in the end it should be relatively close to uh, the sum of the size of the samples right with a little bit of correction for the difference in variance but the underlying idea is sort of again this thing okay so then we have seen that together we have performed a little bit of a t-test with this mice weight and we found that we get then a test statistic a degree of freedom as you can see here the degree of freedom is you see here 44 and if you remember we have in this mice group we have respectively 21 and uh, 29 if i remember correctly uh, uh elements okay so the sum of of this is 50 okay and so you can see that the degree of freedom is sort of related to that it's not exactly that because as i said there is 
some amount of normalization done based on the on the respective variance of both elements, but it should be in the ballpark of you know in the order of magnitude of the number of samples that you have in total. And so then this test statistic for uh, for a t distribution with a degree of freedom equal to forty four point twenty five has a two-sided p-value of 9.25 five, uh, times 10 to the power minus 10. So we say that then it was very, very, very unlikely that we would have observed such data, such difference in mean if um, the two groups were, you know, were, you know, obtained from population with the same mean. And so we can say that we reject H0. So we reject the hypothesis that the mean of the population are the same, okay? And so what we do when we say that is we say, okay, provided that the assumption of the test were true, I say that I'm making sort of a bet that the mean of the population are actually different and not the same and the risk associated to that bet that I'm making is 10 to the power minus uh, 10, or here it's 9.34, so that's 10 to the power minus 9. And so I'm, I could say that I'm making a bet with not too much risk here. The probability, the probability that I'm wrong when calling that is actually quite small. And furthermore, what you can add on top of it is also because here, what this tells you is about uh, statistical significance, okay? But then you want also to have uh, an evaluation of the biological significance. So you can also say this difference in mean, the observed difference in mean between the two sample is here, minus 8.43 gram. And sorry, you can relate that to uh, the actual mice weight and say, okay, that's, you know, this eight gram it's about um, 25, 20% of the weight of the mice. Okay. Uh, so there's a question by Rosario um, uh, asking, how can we use and evaluate the test statistic result of a t-test? So the, here the test statistic result is the value that will be compared uh, and that will be uh, looked at in uh, a in the in the in the t test statistics okay so that's basically um here uh, to compute the p value for a test statistic of let's say minus 7 i would have to go and look at that low and go up until minus 7 which might be maybe somewhere i don't know maybe somewhere around here right and again plus 7 would be somewhere around here maybe and then I would sum like the total density underneath uh, the curve from this point and uh, with the one uh, from that point on, sum the two, and that's how I get my p-value. Right, okay. So that's basically what we do when we draw this sort of thing there. And here, as you can see here, we are already with something very, very small when we are here. So if we are at minus seven around there, then of course it's quite tiny. Okay, so we have seen that together. And then we have hammered in the point that, of course, all of this presumes, as I said each time, that the assumption of the test were true. So we have also to learn one thing is to test if this assumption are true or true enough. And the second, what to do when they actually are not true at all, or if we, when we don't want to make the bet that they are true. Um, so that's when we talked about testing normality. We discussed the fact that there was no perfect normality test as of yet. I don't know, maybe in a few years there will be. I kind of doubt it, but who knows? Uh, and uh, so we have seen that then to kind of circumvent the fact that there was no test that was perfect, I advocate um, a dual approach where you do a plot, okay, you use basically your nice and beautiful human eye and human brain 
that is able to catch many patterns easily. And you just represent then the QQ plot, which is the theoretical quantile versus observed uh, quantile. And if you use the normal distribution for your theoretical quantile, then if the data follows something close to a normal distribution, then you should see your point close to this uh, diagonal line there. And in particular, you should not see any particular pattern to this deviation from, uh, from the diagonal. So this is here what a normal distribution looks like with 100 points. And this is here what an exponential looks like when with 100 points. And here you can kind of see that most of the time it follows at the extremities. We are talking about fairly unlikely heaven. So there is always a little bit of deviation that's quite expected. But here you can see that there is clearly kind of a pattern of deviation around the diagonal line. And that's what should alert you toward the fact that you are playing with some data which is not normal. So that's one wrong. And then our cycle angle of attack is an actual test. And the problem, if you will, is that these tests, the test of normality, always presume normality as their null hypothesis. And this causes problem to us because um, the way that we conduct testing does not control well the amount of error that we do when we are in the accepting H0 scenario. Okay, which is what we would want there with the test of normality, where the null hypothesis is the normality. So that means that we can use that test to have a small idea or to reject normality, but the test does not allow us to comfortably accept normality. Okay, we really never accept H0, we merely uh, fail to reject H0. Okay, so we are in this uncomfortable scenario, which is why we also want to have this uh, visual approach. So then what you do is that you use, for instance, the Shapiro's test, okay, which works very well up till uh, 5,000 points. So that should cover most cases. And this one should give you either a fairly high p-value if your data is close enough to normality that a, uh, a deviation is not detected, which might be because your data is normal or because you're, you don't have too many points and your data is not so removed from normal that you don't detect a difference, okay? So that's the big grain of sand that you have to accept. Or, you know, if you get a small, small, small p-value, that's let's say maybe the best case for you because then you can fairly comfortably reject H0. And so that's when you would use the, the test for its actual purpose, that is rejecting H0. But then that means that you cannot very comfortably use the t-test because one assumption is breached. So you have to go to something else. All right, again, everything is good. Everything is, you know, back together, everything making sense? I have one question. Yeah, Andre. go ahead. If I have many, many groups, many samples as you yesterday, for example, have referred to genes or whatsoever. So, mm -hmm. so how many of my samples would I need to test for, for normality or would it be the correct way to test really all of them? All of them. Uh, so you want to test all of them separately and uh, so that happened to me not so, 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 so long ago. Uh, and so the thing is that then you test all of them and you have to then contend with what do you do when you see that maybe 50% of them uh, look like they could be normal and the other 50% of them uh, look like they are not normal, right? Mm -hmm. That's, I would say, the typical case. And so in that sort of case, personally, I err on the side of caution and would say you use non-parametric for all. I know, but you, you so my question, initial question mm -hmm. was really oh, you ahead. test all of them yeah. for normality. Okay. Yeah, and you test all of them separately. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, so 
you, you, the groups should be tested for, that's something that I did not discuss too much, but the groups should be tested for normality separately. Um, I think this can be demonstrated uh, fairly easily. Why? That imagine that you have two groups uh, which are normal, but are very different. That means that if you take the entire data set, it should look something like this, right? A density plot. So you would have uh, group one here and group two here, okay? And each group taken separately is normal. But then if you pull them together, well, you have this sort of bimodal distribution, which will not be detected as normal by all the tests. Okay, so that's why you should always Wait. test them separately. Okay. So uh, we are in this context. Uh, we are now able to have a reflection on whether or not our data is normal or not. Okay, and ideally we would want it to be, if not normal, at least close enough to normal. Okay. We have to sometimes be careful. Some tests will require strict normality. So for instance, um, we'll see that uh, later on today, but an ANOVA is a test that requires that the data is normal. And some other tests are a bit more relaxed in the sense that they don't require normality of the data itself, but normality of the mean of the data. Okay, and so remember, we have our central limit theorem that tells to us that if we have enough data points, even if the original data is not normal, then its mean is normally distributed. So that means that sometimes, even if you see like some deviation here, for instance, here, remember, here I have an exponential distribution, okay? It's fairly clear that it's not normal, but there are 100 points in this sample. And if we remember your small, our small experiment form earlier, already when there were only 50 points in a, an exponential sample, then the mean of the sample was nearly normally distributed, okay? So that would be kind of a case where here I could constat, I could detect non-normality, but I would, be able to say that there is enough sample that despite the fact that the data itself is not normal, its mean is normally distributed. And so the assumption of the t-test would not be breached. I would still be able to use the t-test. So that's something sometimes that we have to take into account or think about. Uh, and we have also to you know, make sure that some you know, tests, you know, if they require strict normality of the data itself, or if it's just the normality of the mean. All right, and of course, uh, there is a question by uh, by Eng. Yes. Yes, I'm just wondering if we have enough data to use the central limit theorem, then why mm -hmm. bother to check the normality? Because you will assume, uh, and the t-test integrity is not compromised. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a very fair question. So, as mm -hmm. I said, depends a little bit on what sort of test you want to you want to apply. Uh, some tests do require strict uh, normality, mm -hmm. and also um, to different to determine if you will how much data is enough. Like uh, as I said, CLT states that uh, with a large enough number of samples, then you are fine. But then large enough <laughs> is not so easy. So it's to me, it's always kind of worth it to at least have a little look to see how much you deviate. Um, because that can help you inform, you know, uh, if enough is enough. So if you have 100 point, it's likely that, uh, it will be, it will be okay, but you can always check. And also in that, let's say in this very particular case, I could say here, there is a very clear pattern and see if I can actually, you know, uh, define that using something that we know, for instance, here, an exponential distribution in which case maybe actually using a specific test or actually using some simulation to test if 100 point is enough would be feasible. So that's also not time lost. Okay, thank you. Thank you, welcome. So, all right, so yeah, there's, I would say most of the time, 
you will see that you don't necessarily have 100 samples, but maybe 20, maybe 30, and so on and so forth. And so there, you are kind of in this gray area where, for instance, if you have something that is too far away from a normal world, like an exponential, the CLT might not apply. So it's also why you have to do the test. Okay, so then if you are not confident with respect to the uh, to the assumption of your test, okay, be the normality, be the equality of variance for some other tests or so on and so forth, you have to then use another test. And typically we fall into the family of what we call non-parametric tests, which are great because they don't make any assumptions about the distribution of your data and so on and so forth but they also have a loss of statistical power. That means that they have a bit more difficulty uh, differentiating fine, small differences uh, between two data sets. And so we have seen one example of non-parametric test, which is the alternative to the t-test. That's the man whitney u test. We won't go into the detail of how it works. Remember that it often time is linked to the difference in rank between your two samples. And we can then get a p-value, even if we have very little data, if we cannot presume anything about the anormality and so on and so forth, doesn't matter, okay? So that's a really, I would say, great property of these, of these tests. And I personally like them quite a lot. All right, um, but that got us then onto this whole idea of like what were p-values, what is statistical power, and the different kind of error that we can make when we do some testing, okay? So remember, you have your type one error and the type one error is the, uh, is the error of rejecting H0 while it is true. And so that's typically the probability that is described by your p-value, okay? So your p-value gives you the probability that you are making a type one error when rejecting H0, okay? It's the you know, how much, uh, what is the probability that you are making a bad bet? And then the second one, which is a bit more insidious, is a type two error, is the converse. That's the probability of accepting H0 while it is false. So that's the fact that maybe there is an actual difference, but you were not able to detect it. And so you would fail to reject H0. And so then, do a type two error, okay? And so the type one error, yeah, we control it very finely because it is our alpha, our you know threshold for acceptance. This is our five percent or one percent or you know whatever you decide your threshold should be. But beta is more complex because it depends on the existence of this alternative scenario, okay? And so it, it can only be defined for a precise definition of the alternative hypothesis, finer than just difference of mean, okay? You have to say a difference of mean of that many for a uh, standard deviation of that much and so on and so forth. So there are nevertheless some um, ways uh, to compute that, but we have then to kind of fix the sort of uh, the sort of difference that we actually expect to exist. So that means that you need to have prior knowledge about your data for that. So either from the literature or from a small pilot study that you conducted. And we have seen together that it's actually, uh, you know, you can actually use poor calculator. Here's some from stat models, which has also some from, so from t-test for chi-square for most of the tests that we'll see today and for whom we give what we call an effect size. The effect size is the difference in mean divided by the standard deviation of the, uh, of the samples. And uh, then for that, for each uh, sample size, you can compute the power, that is the ability of detecting uh, the actual difference for a given alpha threshold, okay? So typically 0.01. And you can either make a nice beautiful line like we have seen, uh, I've shown here, or you can actually have the calculator compute for yourself directly what would be the min minimal sample size, all right? Or alternatively, you could also uh, 
fix the number of size and then ask what should be the FX size? What would be the minimum FX size for a given level of power? Okay, that also can give you an idea of, okay, how much of an important effect uh, does there need to be for me to have an 80% chance of detecting it, given a sample size of 30, for example. All right, so that also gives you an idea. Let's say you already have a study, you already have your, your data, you know that you have 30 individuals in each group. Well, you see then, okay, how much, you know, how big of an how big you know uh effects will i be able to detect will i only be able to detect only the like the biggest stuff the most important ones or will i also be able to detect finer differences between the groups that's the idea okay so then from then we played a little bit and we came back to this mice data set and we have seen together then uh, that when we try to compute in effect uh, the power of uh, of this particular t-test, it can be a bit complexified by the fact that the two samples have differing um, standard deviation. And so in order to be able to input the standard deviation uh, inside our power computer formula, we had to actually use this pooled variance uh, formula that will uh, make an estimate of their of the global variance of the sample inside both group and you can see that this is basically the variance of both groups uh, and but normalized by the size of each group if we make it simple and then once we have that we are able to compute the power which is actually quite high there all right so far so good Everything is still making sense. Yes, there is Rosario. Hi, just uh, maybe a very basic question. I didn't mm -hmm. get so much the type two error. If mm -hmm. I understand this, if we wrongly accept the null hypothesis. Yes. But this then can raise just in certain statistical tests like normality tests where we need to accept the new hypothesis or you know what i mean like i i i have like this confusion a bit in my head because like in certain tests like normality tests we like to have a, a big p value in mm -hmm. order to um, think that we have normality yeah so in this case we can have the type 2 error but in the other tests we need to reject the new hypothesis so how can we have the type 2 error uh so okay so there's maybe two two things to disconnect. The first is what we would like to see. And so usually for most tests, we would like to have a small p-value and reject H0. And for the normalities, we would like to see maybe a big p-value and fail to reject H0. So that's what we would like. And we have to disconnect that from what actually happens. What actually happens in the end is that you always have uh, a p-value and this p-value will be above or under a threshold and depending on that you will fail or uh, you will sorry reject or fail to reject h0 that is what will happen in the end and so because you always have the possibility of either rejecting h0 or failing to reject h0 which time you will fail to reject h0 okay even even in a t-test then that means you run the risk of committing the type 2 error. Does that make more sense? Yes, thank you. I see. OK. So we then finished uh, the day with the concept of multiple hypothesis testing. And that's something which I think is important to maybe not know by heart, but it's very important to have uh, knowledge about because it's very common that we don't just test two group uh, but that we actually test many different groups or that we check many genes for significant difference between two groups or this sort of stuff and because remember we are in this framework where we have probability of doing different kinds of error and that means that any decision that we make when we do a test is is not 
the truth is just a bet. It's a bet where the probability of making an error, for instance, if you say that you reject difference, the probability of making an error is, uh, is your p-value. And if you say that you don't reject, the probability of making an error is the power of the test. So then you are making a series of tests and it tends to reason that even if you try to control the probability uh, of making an error, if you make a lot of bet, you will, you know, again, statistically, uh, you will lose a portion of these bets, okay? And so we have to reflect, we have to think about what it means uh, and what could be the implication because losing a portion of your bet might not be a problem, but you might also have some cases where if you have this kind of overinflation, we know that we are we tend to over represent positive result and 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 hide a little bit negative result, then that means that you can actually have a distortion of the sort of confidence that we can have about uh, uh, about some results if you don't try and account for that. So that's when we have a new framework that tends to try to account for the fact that you are testing for many multiple hypotheses um, at the same time. And for that, we have two main framework, okay? The FWER, family-wise error rate. And this one is computed fairly simply by just saying that if you have a threshold of significance of 0 0.05 and you do end test, then only care about p-values which are under 0 0.05 divided by your end test. So you do d, uh, if you do 10 tests, then your new threshold becomes 0 0.005. This is very, very simple. This is what we call very conservative. That means that with this framework, you will not make a lot of type one error. Okay, that means that if you call something significant under this framework, then there is a very high probability that it's actually significant, okay? But conversely, that means that you have then a loss in statistical power. So you run a much higher chance of, um, of, of committing type two error. That means that there would be a real difference, but you don't detect it. Conversely, there is the FDR, so false discovery rate, which aims to find a middle ground there and the way that it works, if we make it simple, is that you will sort all the p-values that you have obtained. And um, you will try to then define a set of significant tests such that no more than, let's say, 5% of these tests that you defined as significant would be false positive. So you try to say, okay, I know that I will make some false positives. That's kind of a given. And I will try to make sure that there is no more than a you know, low number of false positives, for instance, 5%. So that I can trust 95% of the test, which I declared as significant. Okay. And so this has been shown to control then your type one error okay it's still present but at least it's kind of controlled and still conserve a good amount of the power of the test so it's a middle ground between using the row p value which uh, will give you uh, good power but very bad type one control and the fwer which gives you very bad power but very good type one error control so here the procedure is that you sort your p-value and then for each p-value uh, you look at you know at this given p-value threshold um, who much would be would be uh, likely to be uh, obtained just by chance so that would be uh, this alpha n so uh, 0 0.05 for instance times the number of tests that you do uh, and you divide it by the actual number of discovery of that threshold. And that lets you have a, an estimate, if you will, of the amount of false discoveries that you would make if you would decide that this would be your threshold for significance. And you find the balancing point where 
this fraction there is equal to 0 0.05 or whatever your FDR would be. All right. So Can we I then maybe ask a very specific question to that. Oh, go ahead. Um, so, for example, if I, I have a cell and I look at the proteins that they express, mm -hmm. and then I have another cell that I treat with a drug and I want to see which proteins, for example, are over or under expressed. Um, yes. So I compare the two. Do I then have to do that? And the number of observations is like the how many proteins I look at? Exactly. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Because so in your setups, you would do one test per protein. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. But that's that's the exact use case. Yeah. And so then I try to just demonstrate this. Uh, I will not go again through that uh, unless you want me to, but you can come back to it later on if you're interested to see a little bit and to get acquainted with how much uh, how this works and how these correction procedures offers to you different, uh, if you will, balance point or different uh, strategies when it comes to the control of one or the other of your type of errors. Okay. So that's the recap. Uh, it took a bit of time, but we are quite on time. We have the time for that. And I think that it's important as there were so many information yesterday that we go through that again uh, so that we can now start the rest of the of the course on a good basis.